Sure, give me one second. a while. Welcome to the Complete Streets Commission's April 10th regular commission meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with commission members, city staff, and members of the public participating in accordance with public health guidelines. I would like to introduce Complete Streets Commission members and city staff present. I'm Chair Jackie Sebrian. Commissioners present include Brian Altman, Katie Baruzzi, Sally Cole, and Lizbeth King. City staff present include Kevin Chen and Matthew Hui. Matthew, could you please provide instructions to the commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Chair Sabrian and members of the Complete Streets Commission. Welcome everyone to the April 10th Complete Streets Commission meeting and thank you for attending. For members of the public who wish to provide public comment for any item on tonight's agenda, after the chair calls for public comment on that item, Virtual attendees on Zoom may engage the raised hand feature, or if you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. If you're participating in person, please wait for the chair to call your name. You can then step up to the podium to make your comment. That concludes the instructions and I return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Under reports and announcements, city staff and commission members may communicate general information of interest regarding matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. No commission discussion or action can occur on any of the presented items. Kevin, are there any reports and announcements? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a few announcements to update the count commission on. Uh, so first and foremost, the city council did adopt the fiscal year 2024-2025 budget principle. So this is really just a kind of an overarching goals for the, the city council as far as the, the, the this upcoming fiscal year budget is concerned. There is, if you're interested in the topic, there is a table in the staff report that I shared with you guys a while ago. Um, there's a table in there that kind of outlines the budget development calendar for you. The next item on the agenda on their agenda for the budget is going to be our capital improvement plan. So certainly for those that are interested in those type of um, items, uh, feel free to kind of peruse through the staff report. Uh, so that concludes the uh, update for the city council. I do have a couple of items I want to share with the commission as well. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, a big thanks to Matthew that's um, in on our Zoom right now handling it. Uh, because of him, we were able to we are able to partner with uh, UC Berkeley's Safe Transportation Research and Education Center, Safe Track. Um, the, the idea behind that partnership is to conduct a complete street safety assessment effort. And the effort is gonna be on Santa Cruz Avenue from Cloud to University, and then also Sand Hill Row from Oak Avenue to Sharon. And with the Sand Hill portion, we're also gonna be including that one block of Alpine from Sand Hill to uh, Juno Pacera Boulevard as well. So all of that is an effort that is gonna, gonna be um, starting pretty soon, actually. As a matter of fact, our first meeting is gonna be uh, April 24th. It's gonna be a Wednesday. We're still going through all the details of the timing, et cetera. We're trying to fit both corridors. And as you know, those are very lengthy corridors within, within a single day. And our very own vice chair, uh, Sally Ko, is gonna be part of that effort as well. So. Definitely happy that we um, got the um, the partnership and, and continue to put safety in the forefront for the city. Um, not sure. not My sure. only comment is just, I also really appreciate the efforts of staff because living on Santa Cruz and knowing that we have, uh, you know, traffic speed issues and some um, crossings that need protection. In fact, the day before we all met for the first time, there was an accident right two houses down from me where a bike got hit crossing properly at um, San Mateo and Santa Cruz. So it was all top of mind. Um, and as Kevin said, on April 24th, we're doing literally a day long site walk, both in the mornings to see the traffic um, and the kids at Hillview and also throughout the day and then seeing them exit Hillview as well. So um, I think it's gonna be a really good hands-on data collecting exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one last item I would like to update the commission on. I know some of you might have received some inquiries from your residents 
about the um, Assembly Bill 413. So for some of you that might already know this, the Assembly Bill basically made it a, into a state law where um, as you're approaching a crosswalk, either mark or unmark, the first 20 feet or so should be clear of uh, no parking zone. So it will be designated as a no stopping zone, 20 feet leading to a crosswalk. So that is a state law that is a um, now in effect statewide. Um, and then our police department are fully aware of that. Staff on our end is looking into how to properly implement that law as well. We're looking at how to best make residents aware of it, and then also prioritize which corridors get those first. So certainly some, something that's in the back of our mind, but I, I understand that some of you have been getting inquiries about that. So I wanted to let you know that this is, this is something that we're working on as well. So uh, with that, I will conclude my announcements. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question about that, Kevin? Yes. Does that include unmarked crosswalks? So the ones that are implicit at intersections yes. as well? Yes, yeah, both marked and unmarked. Okay, so somewhere where a crosswalk is not painted, but there's an intersection. Exactly. Or... If it's an intersection, technically they're all crosswalks, just unmarked crosswalks. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. Um, does anybody else have any? Okay. Uh, hang on a second. Sorry. How did I lose my place? Oh, okay. Under public comment, members of the public may address the Complete Streets Commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda items brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. Matthew, can you please call for general public comment? Yes, thank you, Chair. For virtual attendees who wish to provide general public comment, you may engage the raise hand feature, or if you are calling in from a landline or cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. If you're participating in person, please wait for the chair to call your name. You can then step up to the podium to make your comment. I see one virtually raised hand from uh, Stephen P. Uh, you should be allowed to talk now. Oh yeah, so um, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking my comments. Um, uh, my question is, or I, I guess the, for tonight's comments, uh, there was quite a bit of um, um, input from the community. And I want to just restress how there needs to be some, some more consideration for tenants and renters along Middle Avenue, um, some uh, accommodation for them because a lot of them don't have parking, and so what uh, they tend to sorry, do is Steve, park on the side street. I sorry. apologize for um, for interrupting, but um, this is in the public comment period for non-agendized items. Oh, okay. The, uh, the oh, okay. is agendized, so if you don't mind, just wait for oh, us. Oh, great. No problem. Um, sorry about that, then. No, no worries. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can. I'll continue later. Thank you. Seeing no more virtually raised hands, I return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Under regular business, the commission considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters and administration administrative actions that require commission approval. The first business item tonight is accept the complete streets commission minutes for March 13th, 2024. Any clarification yes, from yes. the commission before I take public comment? Sorry, uh, I apologize, Chair. I actually um, misread one of the public comment cards, um, and I do have a gentleman that wants to speak for the non-agendized item period. So I do apologize for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. David Pollock. Sorry about that.
Thank you. I do have a comment on the minutes. Um, I did have a comment on the minutes. Is now the right time? I apologize. Yeah. So if we can go ahead and resume the minute item. Okay. Thank My you. apologies. That's all right. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Uh, Kevin, I uh, was reading the minutes and at the very end of um, the summary about the council's discussion about the transportation demand program, I thought there was a, a point that was made in the meeting that might not have been captured in the minutes. And I went back to the video to check on this. Um, but I felt that the commission had come to an agreement with you that in the staff, the staff would reflect in um, their report to city council that the Complete Streets Commission recommended to move with urgency on getting the city to a 40% uh, no drive alone trips percentage. Mm -hmm. And I think we also said, um, and this is for new development. And I think we also said that was um, particularly important because of all the new development coming online for the city. And I think that you had added that um, the staff would ask direction from the city council um, about the timing. Like we would recommend that we treat this with urgency for those reasons and that you would then ask the council um, to provide a timeline. That, that's correct. So we were trying to sort of capture that essence um, with that last bullet point where there was kind of sort of a, a consensus about you know, making it from 35 to 40, that's where the 5% or more comes in where feasible. So th basically that, that is kind of the, the end, the, the starting point for a conversation with the city council. So are you saying that we should add another bullet and just yes. be more explicit about that? I think that Got the it. point that's being missed there is that we said that uh, we agreed that uh, the staff would reflect to the council that th this commission wanted, recommended strongly to move with urgency on okay. that. And I didn't think that point was captured. I also was concerned about the use of the phrase where feasible, because it sounded like it was watering down a bit. I don't know. Could you read that bullet point again that ends with where feasible? This is just yeah. important to me. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the bullet point reads increase vehicle trip reduction targets by 5% or more where feasible. And um, where, where staff comes in with that where feasible uh, specifically comes in is there were a bit of a back and forth conversation yes. with regard to uh, the location of yes, the development. There was, right? there was. So the I, th I think what, what I wanted to say, yes, there was a lot of back and forth conversation. And I appreciate how seriously we all took that, um, that measure, that standard that we're trying to hit as a city with new development in part, because we were comparing um, the standard that we were adopting with that that was existing in neighboring cities, which was a higher standard. So um, I guess where feasible, maybe if you, uh, I, there, I think there might be another way to put that in something like um, uh, with allowing for different percentages in different parts of the city or something just a little more specific. But if you wanna leave it as where feasible, that's okay with me. I plan to go to the city council meeting when you talk about this to, to sort of emphasize these points, but I just wanted them to know that one of the approaches we thought could be appropriate would be to increase the bar to 40, but to give latitude to the staff to assign different percentages based on location within the city, as long as we rolled up to a higher um, percentage. So I can also make that point with the city council. Okay. Thank you for uh, yeah. adding the bullet about urgency though. Thank you. Okay. Um, commission minutes. Matthew, can you please call for public comments on this item? Yes, thank you, Chair. For virtual attendees who wish to provide public comment on this item, you may engage the raise hand feature, or if you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. If you're participating in person, please wait for the chair to call your name. You can then step up to the podium to make your comment. Seeing no virtually raised hands, I return a meeting to the chair. Thank you. So through the chair, we do have a public speaker here in the audience, uh, Adina Levin.
made a public comment about this topic at the Complete Streets Commission, I wanted to uh, bring forward just a little bit more color, uh, bolstering what the commission is wanting to do here, because in the back and forth uh, with staff about the uh, w welcome desire of the commission to uh, be as strong as possible, I think there were some hypothetical, so I, I think that having some differentiation between parts of the city is reasonable, um, but there were also some um, hypotheticals that maybe like out by the Bayshore, it's really hard to have a high uh, non-drive alone mode share. And in some of the cities that I reported on in public comment, um, for example, in Sunnyvale on their Moffitt uh, specific plan, which is also by the Bayshore, and in um, Google um, with their North Bay Shore plan, they do have um, significantly strong goals and transportation demand management uh, policies and um, either operating or proposals for, for TMAs. So it is possible to have a strong uh, non-drive alone mode share goal, including in a Bay Shore area that then is running a, you know, shuttles back and forth um, connected to mainline uh, uh, rail and also having like um, other transportation options. And so I think that a stronger position is warranted and having the, the city move as quickly as possible to assess what is possible and then strengthen um, is good. And then also one thing that other cities do, um, which I'll also comment on this to the city council, is to have policies that have an increasing ratchet. So for example, um, there's some that have said, for example, when Caltrain gets electrified and lo and behold, Caltrain is expected to be electrified in September, that they're gonna have a, a, a stronger TDM standard. Or you know, um, uh, maybe when other parts of our transportation, like similarly be able to ratchet up when things come into effect. So it is possible to do that. Other cities do that. And we should look at, you know, not just the lowest common denominator policy that is, you know, good and needed to have at CCAG as the lowest common denominator, but we should be looking at the best practice to pursue them rather than the lowest common denominator. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, do I have a motion and second to accept the minutes? All right. Second. Okay. Uh, Sorry, is that a motion by Commi Co Council uh, <laughs> Commissioner Altman, Altman. and then a second, second by Commissioner King? Great. Thank you very much. So, for those commissioners that would like to vote yes, if you can please raise your hand. I'm seeing four hands, and Council Commissioner Baruzzi is abstaining. Thank you. Okay. Um, Item E2, recommend a preferred design for the Middle Avenue Complete Streets project to the City Council. Um, Kevin Chen, Senior Transportation Engineer, can you present this item? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. If you can just allow me a couple of seconds to share my screen with you all. Then... Okay, excellent. So I, th I believe at this point, the members and the audience via Zoom can also see the first slide of my presentation. Great, thank you very much. So um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Chen, Senior Transportation Engineer with the City of Menlo Park. I'm very happy to be here tonight to present this item that's in front of you. It's been a long time coming, I think, and um, this started a couple of years ago, and I do want to at least shout out a couple of folks that are currently with the city and, and also folks that are no longer with the city that is instrumental to the project itself here. So first of all, a quick shout out to Matthew, who is again on the, um, on the Zoom with us here tonight. Uh, he's been instrumental in sort of the, the pilot phase of this project, getting all the data, uh, consult, um, evaluating them, and then really kind of a, a big toll on, on the data analysis itself. 
Also a quick shout out to my former colleagues, uh, Esther John and Hugh Louch. So they both were with me on this project from the beginning back in uh, 2022 when, it would have, when we had our first community meeting in the rain and they have since moved on to other places, but they certainly want to shout them out because they've been instrumental to the project as well. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started with my presentation. So many of you probably in the audience and, and on the dais know about this project already. So I'll try my best to consolidate the presentation and hopefully save some time for the Q&A and also hearing feedback from, from the general public as well. So the agenda tonight is pretty full. We, uh, I'm gonna go over quite a few items. First with uh, the project goals. We always wanna know exactly why we're doing a project that we're doing with uh, followed by the background of the project and a quick summary. So this project is multifaceted. We are here tonight specifically for the bike lane pilot. However, that is one component of the project. So I wanna highlight some of the other components as well. Of course, once that's done, get into the, dat the data analysis, what type of data were collected, what they are, and then presenting those data for, for, uh, for you guys. Of course, with the pilot, that means we also will have a recommendation from staff about what to do with the pilot. And of course, in addition to the recommendations, because of the amount of research and, and, and uh, feedback that we receive, there are other elements that we have heard that is not part of the recommendation, but we wanted to make sure we bring that to your attention as you, can, as you kind of prepare yourself for that recommendation as well. And then finally, once everything is done, we're gonna look at the project schedule, the overall schedule of uh, hoping to get to the end goal, which is construction by next summer summer of 2025. Okay, so let's just go ahead and start with the project goal. As we all know, Middle Avenue is one of the key east-west corridors. So improving Middle Avenue certainly will be a benefit for many, many users within the city and even outside the city for that matter. So here are the three primary goals that we're trying to achieve for this, for this project. First is to enhance bicyclists and pedestrian visibility and improve their safety. So this is really, if you consider this to be sort of a, a localized improvement, right? S secondarily with the, the second bullet point, we want to provide a safe and comfortable uh, cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. That's where the bike lane comes in. And of course, with middle being a key east-west connectivity for the, uh, for the city, we also wanted to just take a quick step back and look at how this project will be able to increase accessibility uh, for the entire city beyond just uh, what's to the left and what's to the right of Middle Avenue. So obviously with Middle Plaza um, that is built, getting occupied, as well as the, un the Middle Undercrossing, which is a pedestrian and bicyclist access point for to get across the train track. That right there is a kind of that icon, ladder looking icon in the, in the image to the right. Um, with that project, when with Middle Avenue, Middle, middle will, come, will be a, a truly a east-west connectivity that connects to the left of the track and to the right of the track as well. So certainly Middle Avenue, we're focusing on Middle Avenue as a whole, but we wanted to kind of acknowledge the impact that would it have uh, for, the, for the entire city as well. So just a couple of dates for the benefit of the commission. As we all know, this project kickstarted in March of 2022. Um, so two years in the making, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. As, as we continue with the planning effort, the two key dates that I wanna highlight is October 18, 2022, where the city council approved the traffic calming measure uh, component of this project. So as I, as I mentioned before, the Middle Avenue Complete Streets project has many components, traffic calming being one of them. Later on, I will have a slide showing what those traffic calming measures are. But at this point, I believe most of the commissioners are, are pretty well in tune with what they are. Uh, the second date is the February 14, 2023. So that's the date where the city council approved the pilot that we're seeing on the ground today. And uh, the, the pilot that was approved by the city council was to remove parking on both sides of Middle Avenue for the installation of a buffer bike lane. In addition to that, there was some reconfiguration 
of the parking in front of Nilan Park. So we have a parking lot for Nilan Park, but also in front of it, there's a, a strip of parking spaces, reconfiguring that space for the benefit of adding a buffer bike lane. So once the, once the approval was, uh, was given, staff went back to the drawing board, started the design and, and, and then and followed by the construction. And of course, by October, 2023, everything is now on the ground as you see today. The next couple of slides are just some of the images I wanna show you of what's out there. Here is a, a couple screenshots of the section between Olive Street and University Drive. Here, I just wanted to highlight a couple of key elements that we did for that project. As you can see, we removed parking on both sides of the street for the benefit of adding a buffer bike lane. In addition, at the intersection of Olive and Middle, we also did some reconfiguration of the intersection as you approach Olive for the benefit of separating bicyclists and, and the vehicular traffic. Um, primarily, the reason for that is this particular intersection is heavily used by kids as well as commuters uh, going different direction of the day. So we wanted to make sure that we improve this section, uh, this particular intersection as much as we can. Of course, the other section of Middle Avenue is University Drive and El Camino, where we have the Nilon Park in front. So here are a couple of additional screenshots for that section. The one on top uh, illustrates what's out there today in front of the Nilon Park. The one on the bottom, the bottom right, shows the approach as you're approaching El Camino Real. And then there's an image to the left, bottom left, that shows the cl temporary closure of Blake Street. So this was a part of the approval that, re that we staff received for the traffic calming measure, primarily to further enhance Blake Street for the safety of pedestrians and bicyclists, because that is a crossing that is highly utilized by folks living in the LIR area or, or, or nearby, try to navigate to the park via bike or pedestrian. Uh, Blake Street also sometimes get used as a cut through traffic prior to the closure. So combining those two, um, plus some of the requests from the residents, staff felt like there is a, um, a safety factor that can be, can be achieved here. And as a result of that, we recommended the temporary closure of the Blake Street, which subsequently got approved by the city council. So as I mentioned before, one of the key elements for this project is traffic calming measures. So here is a quick illustration of the traffic calming measures that were uh, approved by the city council. Uh, please do keep in mind that these are conceptual locations. The exact location obviously will differ slightly potentially depending on some of the constraints that we see, but this really gives you a good, good idea where we're putting some of the race crosswalks that we're mentioning, uh, the speed hums, as well as some of those speed feedback signs. So this gives you a good idea where they would be generally speaking. And we try to space it out with some equal amount of distance. So that way, you know, we, we try to be able to kind of control the speeding of those cars by creating a equal spacing as much as we can. So just a couple other items before we go into the meat of the item tonight. One, one other key element that is currently underway that where staff is working in the background is the uh, intersection of El Camino and Middle Avenue. So as many of you know, the signal was recently uh, imp uh, upgraded with the development of the 500 El Camino Real. More traffic are anticipated with that development. And as a result of that, staff is looking into how we can further improve some of the conflicts that we're seeing out there right now. Um, this particular intersection is a Caltrain control intersection. So, so right now staff is doing some of the necessary uh, background operational analysis work in order to start the dialogue with our, um, with our neighboring agencies. So certainly something that is working in the background. I just wanna quickly highlight this to, uh, for the benefit of the audience and the commission. And then lastly, uh, I, as I, mentioned, I have mentioned before, we do also have a street resurfacing component for this particular stretch of Middle Avenue from San Mateo Drive to El Camino Real. So uh, typically with resurfacing, what that means is that we're trying to, um, from, from the gutter to the edge of the gutter, we're trying to rebuild the, the street to be, um, to be better. 
So as you, if you're driven by the up and down the area, you might have noticed quite a few potholes, some cracks, et cetera. So the street resurfacing is in hope of fixing all of that issue. So certainly a, another key uh, element of the project as well. Okay. So now going into really the, the main content of the meeting tonight, the data collection for the pilot here is just a quick um, bullet point of all the data that we have collected. Later on, there's gonna be subsequent slides that show the, um, the summary of those data. So do, do, do wait for a couple of minutes, but this is simply to kind of highlight some of the additional data collections that we have done as well as when they were done. So before the pilot, generally the data were collected between February and April of 2023. When the pilot went in in October, we waited for a few months and then we start collecting data essentially the month of March and April of 2024. So try to be very conscious about the timing of the data, uh, making sure that they are at least somewhat similar from a seasonality standpoint. So in addition to those data collections, we also wanted to make sure that we reach out to some key stakeholders, um, making sure that they are aware of the project and then also getting their feedback uh, as you know, that one of the, the key elements of the, the pilot is a survey, online survey that we have published. So this is our additional outreaches that staff have um, done to further get those feedback. So the, here's just a list of some of those entities that we have reached out to and spoke with. Okay, uh, the next few slides are gonna be essentially a summary of the data that we collected. So. Um, do, do bear with me as I'm maybe talking through some of the slides a little bit slower than, than before. This right here is a quick summary of the volume and speed data that we have collected. Here it shows the before and then after, the, the before pilot and then the with pilot data. So here on the very top, you'll see that we do have two locations where we collected uh, speed data for. Generally speaking, the, date, um, the, the speed has not changed too much. So this, with the section between El Camino and University, it went from 30 to 32 miles per hour. The section between uh, San Mateo and Olive, it went from 33 to 28. Now, one of the feedback that we have received from all the surveys and, and everyone that we spoke to is that speeding is continued to be an issue along Middle Avenue. And as you can see, certainly this is um, proven of that. And one of the key elements that we're trying to do to address this was the traffic calming measure, which have since got approved by the city council. So as you're kind of going through the slides, do keep in mind that one of the key elements or the key concerns about speeding hopefully will be addressed with the traffic calming measures that will go in uh, next, next summer. Of course, with anything with data, we want to look at the volume of the, the, of the, um, the corridor. So in this case, we have the uh, number of cars, number of pedestrians and bicyclists that we collected before and with the pilot. And as you can see, generally speaking, uh, vehicle volumes have minimal change. One of the key concerns that we have is what would the pilot do to the cars? Um, while, while we sh potentially shift them, them elsewhere, are, are they becoming traffic on a different street versus along Middle Avenue? And while the survey did indicate that some people did choose to go um, elsewhere, for example, Santa Cruz or Valparaiso, generally speaking, the volumes have not shifted all too much at all. And then similar to the vehicular volumes for the pedestrians and bicyclists, we're seeing a very nominal increase in, in those two categories as well. Um, generally speaking, you know, with the bike lanes, it, we're, we're improving the pedestrian, uh, I'm sorry, we're improving the bicycle facility along middle for the pedestrians with the traffic coming, we're hoping to improve the crossing of uh, Middle Avenue for the pedestrians. Uh, here's just a, a quick slide of the collision data that we have collected for the past three years versus uh, what have happened since we put in the pilot. Certainly, as I, rec as I mentioned before, we're, we're only a few months into the pilot. So that's, this is certainly simply a, um, a data point that I wanted to kind of share with the commission. Uh, please do note that most of this 
collisions that we have collected either resulted in no injury or minor injury. Um, as many of you know, one of the key elements that we have done, we have achieved for the city this year is the adoption of our Vision Zero plan, where we are aiming to have uh, zero fatality or serious injuries by 2025. So certainly, you know, we're, we're glad to know that of all the collisions that we have collected, there are no serious injuries in this case, but that's certainly something that we want to continue to strive for um, to achieve a zero fatality or serious injuries um, for years to come. Okay, so as I mentioned, Middle Avenue, the bike lane basically requires us to remove parking on both sides of Middle Avenue. So those cars would have to go somewhere be to park. So one of the key thing that we wanted to make sure is we wanted to absolutely know where those cars are going and the occupancy of those side streets. And by occupancy, the, uh, in front of you are essentially the maximum percent occupancy that we have observed throughout various days of the week, various times of the day, so including the weekends as well. So a couple items I hear I wanted to kind of quickly highlight, and as you kind of sipping through your um, survey results, which we attach as an attachment to the staff report, is that we do see a fairly high occupancy at Nilon Park, not just the park itself, but also the, uh, the frontage parking that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Generally, that's associated with games that are happening um, with the tennis courts, the pickleball courts, or the softball, softball field in the back. Generally, our observation is that when those courts are being occupied, the, the occupancy does go pretty high for the parking. Uh, the other item I want to do quickly highlight is that you'll see a couple 95% along Arbor, um, and that is uh, the result of the new community church on Sundays. As you know, the church is uh, at the corner of Middle and Arbor, and they used to be able to have parked cars along Middle, uh, which they now long, long, no longer do. So uh, as a result of that, we are seeing fairly high occupancy rates during those Sundays, um, 95% for Arbor, and then generally about 50% 50, 50 or so for Westfield. Westfield is the one that is right above um, zigzagging between Windsor and Arbor. So, but other than, other than those two locations, I th I th the data is fairly showing that there are still some capacities along some of the minor streets. So while there are certain locations where we're seeing a very high occupancy rate, generally speaking, at least between this stretch of Olive and University, is that there are some capacities to accommodate additional demands if necessary. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we do have an appendix with all the data that we received through the public survey period. So the public survey was open from mid-March to early April. So we have a total of three to four weeks of opening the survey to the general public. Here is a quick snapshot of some of the key elements that might be of interest to you. And again, the attachment has all the a very comprehensive uh, list of all the questions and feedback that we received. I think some of the, the key elements I do want to highlight here is that you know we have over almost 600 survey respondents, which is a great number um, that I think that shows how how enthusiastic people are with what's happening along Middle Avenue. And of course, with the first um, pie chart that you're seeing there, you know, the, the respondents are coming from all over the place. We have 37% that lives on Middle or connected to Middle Avenue. We have about 31% that is elsewhere. And then, oh, my apologies. And then 14% that is actually on Middle Avenue. So if you think about 14 plus 37, that encompasses essentially a lot of the residents that live either on or near Middle Avenue. Um, how often do you travel on Middle Avenue? So I think here is a really good sample size of who is responding to the surveys. About over, over six, uh, approximately 64% of the respondents uh, use Middle Avenue daily, so they really in tune with what's going on along Middle Avenue. The, the next two to your, to your right here, primary purpose for traveling on Middle Avenue. I think one of the one of the key elements that we have 
try to emph emphasize from staff is Middle Avenue is used by multiple groups of users. When not just students, if we, have to, we do have a lot of students, not just commuters, we do have a lot of commuters, but we also have folks that want to use Middle Avenue to access you know, nearby business, not necessarily just on Middle, but nearby. Uh, the parks, we have two great parks along Middle. We have Lyle Park and Nilon Park. And of course, we also have a lot of amenities, for example, Little House, Rosanna House. And then of course, we have the new community church. We have a nursery that's in Nilon Park. We also have childcare next to a new community church. So again, I think this is a really good snapshot of who is using a Middle Avenue and wh why they're using Middle Avenue. Uh, Kevin, can I just ask a really quick clarifying question on the demographics? So do you, I'm assuming you had to be 18 to answer the survey or when you had others there, did you have some kids? I'm just curious. Yeah, we, we, we do have some, you know, young, younger folks. We assume that the parents are there to help them out as well. But okay. um, yeah, generally I try to just kind of lump them into one category. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for point. Yeah, exactly. Actually, can I ask a follow up on that? Mm hmm. When I was reading the comments last night, I was noticing that some of them were verbatim the same. And I don't just mean like a generic verbatim, like I like the bike lane, but like when I walk my two dogs and we cross the street, I encounter da 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 uh -huh. And I'm wondering if you were collecting IP addresses, if there were, how many duplicates do you think might be in here? Yeah. So generally speaking, they they do look at IP addresses and, and duplicates. Um, you know, to, to some extent, it's like kind of extracting that information and making sure that everyone is unique. Um, it does have its own limitation as well. So we do take it with um, with that in mind. But generally speaking, we were able to identify the IP addresses of where, um, where those surveys are coming from. As a matter of fact, we actually have quite a few, uh, not quite, a few surveys that are even like out of state users that they have commented in the comment that they visit um, uh, Middle Avenue for, you know, for um, wh whatever purpose at the time. So we, we do have a pretty good sample size of, of where the IP addresses are coming from. Okay. And then I, I think one of the key elements that we mentioned before is also parking. So I just wanted to kind of quickly highlight the parking experience um, for, for the folks, you know, generally 33% have not tried to park. You know, generally I, that's either because they don't use a car or they, um, they're answering because they, they really are there just to, as a commuter, because they cut through traffic. Um, I think some of the, the, the percentages here that matters is generally speaking, you know, are they having trouble finding parking or are they having no trouble finding parking? And generally speaking, you're looking at, you know, fair, fairly equal amount. There's a little bit more folks that are having some type of trouble finding parking, generally 26 and 12%, so about 38%. 29% had no trouble finding parking. And of course, we wanted to kind of show some data for um, how people are feeling as, uh, as a bicyclist and a pedestrian. So here are some of the key elements um, that we wanted to kind of highlight. So for bicyclists, generally about 60% feel safer as they bike up and down Middle Avenue, which I think generally makes sense because we are um, doing what we can to make that infrastructure safer for those folks. Um, there are also some folks that are feeling less safe. And generally, I, I think if you read through the comments, that's those probably have to do with, there's still some cars sometimes parked in the bike lane, which you know, our PD has done a really tremendous job of curtailing that uh, lately as well. So they they've definitely have done a marvelous job of making, making it safer for the bikes list. Uh, for the pedestrians, as you can see, you know, 36% feel safer um, while 50 feel no change. And that's generally because, you know, the, the pedestrian infrastructure right now that we're hoping to, to uh, improve are the crossings of middle and not necessarily up and down middle. So, and then again, happy to answer any additional survey questions they might have, but here are just some key elements to highlight. Great. Um, so now going into really the great content of the presentation, the recommendations. So, Prior to now, every single slide that we have shown you is really the, the project history, what we have done so far, looking at the data, which then really kind of can be summarized into a couple of the new more slides, and I'll be done with my presentation. The recommendations here are broken into essentially two sections, if you will. The first section in front of you here represents Olive to University, and then the second one will be University to El Camino. 
In this case, staff is recommending between Olive and University to essentially make what is currently out there permanent, which is the buffer bike lanes, no parking zones on both sides. Generally speaking, staff came to that conclusion uh, as we listed here. Generally, even though we do see some high occupancy rates along Arbor during Sundays, our, our data is showing that other streets do have some additional capacities to handle. Now, it, it does mean that folks might have to walk a little further, right? So I certainly want to acknowledge that as well, but we also wanted to, um, based on the data that we have collected, staff is making that recommendation to keep the permanent, uh, keep the existing buffer bike lane permanent. Now looking at the uh, segment between University Drive and El Camino Real, the recommendation previously was to, again to remove parking on both sides, reconfigure what's in front of Neelon Park for the benefit of two buffer bike lanes. In this case, a couple of the, um, uh, some of the additional concerns that we have, which I have a next slide that, that kind of highlights that, but I do want to speak to that a little bit more is we're getting um, quite a few concerns about the configuration in front of Neelan Park, uh, specifically for two reasons. One, the parking demand is quite high. Uh, and then even in the month of you know, March and April, it is it's reflective of that. Additionally, as I mentioned before, Neelan Park, it, since it's a really great park with a great playground, we have quite a few families that use Neelan Park. And additionally, we have a nursery within the park and generally the parents that are loading and unloading those children, they feel like they're not really in a safe environment. So for example, if you're a driver and you have to unload a kid on the driver's side, for example, you have, if you have two or three kids, you have a kid that's on the driver's side, you're essentially unloading into traffic. Now there is a little bit of a buffer in there, meaning the, the width of the parking is about eight, eight and a half feet or so. So the width is there. However, you are still uh, loading and unloading into the travel lane. So that was one of the, those, those were the two main feedback that we got. So as a result of that, staff's recommendation is to um, reconfigure the Neelan Park frontage parking into a back in angle parking. So this is a, um, I think folks that we that we live in Menlo Park, we have seen pull in parkings in downtown, South downtown Santa Cruz, where you drive down and you pull into a 45 degree angle parking. In this case, we're proposing a back in where you drive up and then you pull back 45 degrees into your parking spot. And there's essentially a few reasons why staff is making this recommendation. One, it creates some additional uh, parking spaces to alleviate the demand. So we can increase approximately 10 to 12 spaces, depending on the final design. Additionally, it allows parents to unload their kids uh, sa safer. They, you know, you're no longer unloading uh, towards a street or towards a bike lane. You're now uh, unloading towards a park car or potentially empty spaces. Additionally, if you're unloading stuff from the trunk, now uh, you can unload with the into the sidewalk. So a lot of the uh, the benefits there is to be able to kind of enhance the the loading for for those folks. Um, also, just some additional side visibility issues that we're trying to address. One of the one of the comp feedback that we got was the driveway leading into and out of the parking lot. Uh, there's some side distance. Um, visibility issues. So with, the, with this three design, you should essentially take care of that um, as well. So that is part of the most, those are some, some of the most of the reasons why uh, staff is making that recommendation today. Uh, I do want to at least quickly highlight that we are recommending the reconfiguration as a pilot. So what that means is that we staff want to take this opportunity. As I mentioned before, this is fairly new for the city of Menlo Park, not new for the Bay Area, but new for the Menlo Park. Uh, so we want to take an opportunity to test this out, do what we can to educate the folks um, that are maybe seeing this for the first time for, or for the second time, and then continue to be able to monitor the area and make, uh, make adjustments accordingly. So with that in mind, our goal is that if we do get the blessing of the commission and the city council um, in May, then we want to go ahead and try to implement this new pilot sometime fall of 2024 so that way we can get that going 
uh, as we continue moving forward with the design for the traffic calming and the resurfacing, et cetera, et cetera. So what that means is the rest of this section, so the eastbound direction, as well as the rest of the westbound direction, staff is recommending to make that permanent. So I do want to kind of at least make that distinction right here. Kevin, on this overhead shot, can you tell me where the driveway is exiting? Is that where at the very left? The very left, thing yeah, is? where there's a tree and there's a blue car that's coming black out. Thing. That's the okay. driveway, yeah, black, blue. Uh -huh. That's yeah, the driveway that. right there. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as I mentioned before, those two are our staff's recommendation. However, we do have a lot of feedback that we receive from residents. Uh, here are just some of the the next couple of slides are some of the key ones that we have heard, and we wanted to kind of share that with the commission and hopefully get your uh, consider some of your consideration and feedback as well. So the first one is the intersection of Middle and Olive. So as I mentioned before, the what, what we have out there right now is um, a way to separate the bikes from the cars. However, some of the feedbacks that we have received is that it continues to be a, a, a point of conflict for those cars that are along middle, try to make a right onto Olive, and bikers that are going down middle, try to make a left onto Olive. And generally speaking, we're talking about some of the commuters that are in cars or maybe parents driving their students in the, in, in the morning, uh, or, and then bikers that are try to head to Oak Grove, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a conflict. So in this case, staff is, uh, suggest, is suggesting two potential options that we are hoping to get your feedback on. Uh, option A to your left is essentially an enhanced version of what's out there. And as you can see, what we are trying to do here is we're trying to create a bit more separation between the pet and the bike, I'm sorry, the, the bike and the cars, allowing those cars that are trying to make a turn right onto Middle Avenue, more room and more time to, uh, to observe the environments to their left and to their right. So this is really a way to um, to kind of factor in the conflict point that we have heard hearing, continue to have that conflict point at a lower speed area because your cars are coming to a stop and then approach. So theoretically you're coming you know, about zero and then you proceed. So the interreaction zone, so to speak, it's happening when the car is at a very low speed. Um, more bicycle comfort. So we're trying to make sure that the, the kids, the commuters, the, the you know, recreational users that are using this feel more comfortable as they're making that left turn. Um, of course, uh, this means you know, for the cars, a little bit more challenging uh, as you're making that turn. There's some boulders that will try to continue to create that separation. So there's a little bit of a more challenge for the, for the, um, for the cars. The design to your, to your left is sort of a, a kind of a, a reverse of some of the thought process behind that. Uh, one, we're essentially moving the conflict zone further away from the intersection. As you can see, that's kind of on the bottom right, if you will, that's where the conflict zone starts. And by conflict zones, I generally mean where the bikes and the cars cross, right? That's considered a conflict zone. So that in this case, the, the benefit of this design, we have less confusion at the bike at the at the stop control area, you know, if you are a biker trying to make a left, you're in the bike lane by then. Uh, cars that are making a right turn, you are in the right turn lane. So we essentially completely separate that conflict that's been uh, bringing to our attention by by quite a few folks. Of course, the uh, sort of the drawback of this design is we are essentially creating that conflict zone before the intersection. So if you think about a car that's coming to a stop. Option A, you are essentially starting at zero to a higher speed. In this case, you're probably going about 25 miles per hour or so. So you're essentially crossing that conflict zone at a higher speed. Uh, however, as a driver, you are able to see your bicyclists in front of you more. Hey, Kevin. So those, yes. Did you guys do, did you collect turning movements like at peak hours? So trying to understand how many people are turning left versus right, vehicles we, versus bikes? We did. Yeah. So in terms of the bicyclists, we definitely have more bicyclists making a left turn than the right turn in this case. I believe the peak hour we were looking at about 30, 30 left and then maybe 15 right, if I, if I remember correctly. And then, uh, so those are the, the, the bike splits. What about the drivers? The drivers, I believe I might have to pull up the numbers. I apologize. Um, if you give me some time, I'll, I'll try to pull up the number and I'll answer you a little bit later, if you don't mind. Yeah. 
got a quick question for you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, I think the safe route to school is up olive and a, up to olive, a mm -hmm. right on olive. Right. And then to Oakdale. Right. And that's the posted that's a safe posted. route to school. Right. Primary safe route to school. Mm -hmm. So then if that's the safe route, yeah. assuming kids are supposed to take that route. Right. Then kids would be making a right on all of. Right. So the, the safe route. And left. And what's nice about Oakdale is that right. there's actually traffic guards and a whole bunch of um, other stuff because it's the official um, or it's the primary, I guess it's the primary, it's a, it's a safe primary. Route school. Right. So safe route middle, I assume is a safe route. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a right. So if that is the preferred safe route, mm -hmm. option B would have bikes making a right turn across a car. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, for option B. Option B. So if you're a bicyclist, let's try to make a right. A, 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 no, safe route. Right. I suppose. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if you're following that particular route, you'll be making a right onto Olive. In this case, you'll be essentially riding in the right turn lane as a um, as a bicyclist, and then so making so the a bicyclist right. would be in the green area as well as the right turn lane. Um, they'll be in the right turn lane. They'll be in that share row. So there's um. So it's a share. Uh, it's a share row plus yeah. mark green. Right. The mark the mark green area is a, a dedicated bike lane. Intended for those students that want to make a left okay. turn. So let me see yeah. if I give that back to you. So yeah. I'm I'm a student going up middle, right, right, yeah. and I want to get to Oak Knoll, and I'm doing the safe route, right. right, which would be, oh, I need to move over and get into the Cheryl, right, with the cars, and then make a right on all of. Yes, is that is it? Yes, okay. if, if you want to use that route, and then if I'm coming back, right through the safe route mm -hmm. path. Yeah. I would be coming down Oakdale, making a right, and then a left onto, onto middle. Right. If if that's the route that you want to choose to use. That's yeah. not well, actually the official route. It is. The, uh, well, is it? no, there may be a safe route to school sign there, but but when you look at the walk and roll route. The solo line. The solo line is the preferred. Is it? But okay, but, so I was the so safe routes coordinator, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> and Jackie teaches there, and and I can tell you that the car line goes on Oak on Oakdale. So when they separate the cyclists and pedestrians, the drivers are supposed to go on Oakdale and do the car line, and it kind of they it kind of wins around, and the cyclists take the more direct route, which is to shoot up Oak, okay. and 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 then they, and then there's a and then they separate the turning movements too. So I mean, I can describe it longer. Yeah. There's an error. There's probably an error on the official route map, but that's not that's not how anybody actually goes. So that may be one of the things. That I, actually, I, that may be the underlying point is that um, maybe there should be an update or, or standardization of the safe routes yeah. to school. If perhaps we can I save that. All I do is look at the map. Yes, I, I understand where you're coming from. Perhaps we can save that toward the end after the presentation, rather than yeah. So thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's a history in in in, in what uh, Commissioner Brian uh, Alman mentioned. So, um, yeah, if you can just indulge me, I have two more slides, and then we'll be more than happy to answer any clarifying questions. Um, so, a couple other considerations that we have received from the residents: uh, crossing safety continuing to be one of them, and as I mentioned before, we do have some traffic calming measures that will have raised crosswalks along Cotton Blake uh, to to really kind of enhance those areas. Um, in, in particular, Yale has come out a couple of times. So staff will continue to use, uh, to make some observations along Yale, primarily because uh, Yale is being used by apartment users. As you know, that section of uh, Middle Avenue, north of uh, the north side of Middle Avenue, we have quite a few multifamily units there. And as a result of our pilot, uh, they are now using Yale as a parking um, area and then walking across Middle Avenue to get to their um, apartment. So we do see some increase in, in traffic there. So we, we continue to make the, make the observation um, at that location. Uh, the second one that, that came up a few times is uh, sort of generally, generally circulation within the LIR area. And as I mentioned before, with the clo temporary closure of Blake Street, it does uh, create an uh, inconvenience for some of the folks that maybe want to get into LIR. Now they have to go down either El Camino or uh, University instead of being able to use Blake Street as a cut through. 
Um, as I mentioned, cut through is one of the reasons why we decided for the temporary closure as well. So there's the um, that um, that point point of um, point of conflict as well. So um, th those are essentially keys that that we have heard. Um, no no staff recommendation as far as uh, those concerns are are are, um, are being brought up. However, they are, they have occurred a few times, uh, more multiple times where we felt like we wanted to bring those up to your attention and get some of your feedback as we continue to refine the. The, uh, the pilot uh, as we recommend the final stage of the pilot. And then this is my last slide here, uh, project schedule. So as I mentioned a couple of times throughout the presentation, we do have a goal of trying to get to construction by summer of 2025. So that means tonight we're looking for your feedback on our recommendations, some of the other considerations that I've mentioned already with the goal of tentatively going to the, um, going to the city council on May 7th that's a tentative day, obviously. Um, um, a lot can change between now to May 7, but that is the goal. Um, of course, what that means is once May 7 occurs, we'll have some time uh, for the pilot decision, uh, spring of 2024, followed by the design uh, into fall and winter of this year, again, with the goal of starting construction sometime summer of 2025. And by construction in this case, we're talking about the traffic calming. We're talking about the street resurfacing and um, and uh, just the, the bike lane uh, as well. So we're trying to have a lot going on by the summer of 2025. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and happy to answer any clarifying questions. Anybody have any clarifying questions? Hi, Kevin. Um, I just have two clarifying questions that I didn't find in the um, <clears throat> staff report. One, do you happen to know if the Menlo Park Police, um, when they are ticketing for parking violations, do they have, does it have to be done by a cop by an actual policeman or do they have like traffic sort of meter people that do it? So we, we do have parking patrol team. Um, however, I'm hearing some, I'm hearing some feedback. So hopefully that, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. Um, so, so yeah. So there, you know, our police department, while they are doing a, an amazing job of um, do, do, uh, controlling the the no stopping, they they are short staff at this moment in time. So we're relying on a few officers to um, to, oh. to to yeah. For I was the, just for trying the, to figure out if they had they separated the force that way. Like some people were only traffic people. Do, we we do have a parking enforcement. Oh, you do. Yeah. Okay. Entity, but right now I believe they're short staff. Okay. Yeah. My second question was, was the intention in making the pilot permanent to green stripe the bike lanes? Is that part of the plan? Did I miss that? Green stripe the bike lane? Like to put green stripes in the bike lanes or just to... Yes. So we, yeah. So that is a treatment that we typically would do for bike lanes, especially okay. in the conflict zone area. So the conflict zone where the cars and the bikes are, are mixing, those, okay. those are typically the zones where we would add additional green... Um, pavement markings or, or color to highlight that conflict zone area. So we, yeah, as part of that, as part of the project, we'll identify locations uh, that we want to do some additional green enhancements too. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my last question is, um, what is the actual location of the MA Cooperative Nursery? I guess if you could, if we could look at slide um, mm -hmm. three, which is sort of an overhead, I think, slide three maybe? Or was it the wait? Maybe it was yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, no, no, it was slide. Um, yeah, sorry, thirteen maybe. Okay. 
Well, I, I think this slide, I, I don't see a slide that exactly showcases it. So a little further down, like a couple of slides. Okay. Oh, you know what? Um, right here. Thank you. So you okay. can see that right there on Neelan Park, sort of lower center, if you will, is the nursery. Oh. Yeah. I don't think I've even seen that. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question. Um, I don't want to open a whole can of worms here, but when we're thinking about this as a complete streets project, Kevin? Yes, sorry. Sorry, yes. I know you're looking for the... I also just want to comment that every time I hear Little House, I have to consciously remember that it's not the nursery because you would not. think the nursery would be also called the Little House because <laughs> it's little people. Anyway, um, yes. So uh, sidewalk. Um, I know over the years, the council members have opined that it would be good to also have sidewalks on the middle. I know that because we're doing things in phases and resurfacing is happening first and sidewalks require a more complicated kind of engagement and more money. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not happening imminently, but it also seems as though having the complete sidewalks on middle would help realize a lot of the goals that we're looking at and also make it a lot more comfortable for people mm -hmm. um, who are walking from side streets, for example, um, walking to church. Uh, and I'm wondering if the sidewalk is in the CIP, if it's not, um, what did it, what does it take to get in the CIP and what's a reasonable time frame for this? Is, are we thinking, what's staff's current thinking on sidewalk on middle? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, middle Avenue currently does have sidewalk on the north side of middle. However, the south side intimate, uh, there's definitely certainly gaps that, that can be completed for sure. I think we, we had, we had initially done an estimate back in 2020, mid to late 2022, where the, the cost is quite was quite high. Um, I think in a few millions to, to complete that gap, and then that has to do with some of the um, the infrastructure is necessary. It's not just the sidewalk. There's some additional improvements to um, you know, yeah, curb and gutter utilities. Some uh, we we definitely saw some utilities that are um, you know typically not associated with a sidewalk where it's but fairly heavy, big cost item. So it will continue to be something that we are we're monitoring. One of the things that we're, we're looking into right now is the, the capital improvement plan. So that is actually, as I mentioned before, you know, part, part of the project ex uh, budget exercise is looking at the five-year CIP as well. So that is something that we're looking into right now. And is that a comparable cost to what the Santa Cruz sidewalks were? Uh, I, it, it's kind of hard for me to answer that okay, because the, the Santa Cruz project did also have quite a few um, additional improvements that are beyond sort of your typical sidewalk um, as well. So um, plus Santa Cruz, I think we've done that quite a few years ago and construction costs has gone up quite significantly since then as well. So it's kind of hard to use that as an apples to apple comparison at this point. Yeah, but, but it, it is quite high because of some of the utilities that we have to deal with. Any any more clarifying questions before we go to public comment? Okay. Matthew, can you call uh, actually, I have a quick question, Matthew, before you call for public comment. Um, Kevin, can we take, can we flip and do the in-person public comment before we do the virtual public comment for this? Absolutely. Okay. I can do that, sure. Um, can I ask Matthew to call for public comment, but we take our in-person ones first? Because <laughs> he has that nice spiel. Sure. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, for in-person attendees who are participating, uh, please wait for the chair to call your name. You can then step up to the podium to make your comment. Um, afterwards, we will call for virtual attendees. Um, for virtual attendees who wish to provide public comments, you may engage the raised hand feature, or if you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. I return the meeting uh, to the chair for uh, in-person uh, public comments. Thanks. So through the chair, we do have two public com speaker cars here. Uh, the first one is Mr. Michael Barclay.
West Menlo Park. I've lived there for um, 30 years. I live in District 5. I drive to Middle Avenue uh, nearly every day uh, to Palo Alto. I get to Palo Alto to get to the Safeway uh, or to come here tonight for that matter. Um, uh, let me talk first about three things mainly. Uh, first, the intersection of Middle and Olive. Um, the current pole arrangement um, I find have had to have been very, very difficult when I'm going west on Olive and I want to turn right to go uh, north. I'm sorry, I'm going west on Middle and I want to turn right to go north on Olive. Um, you have to swing kind of wide to get to clear the pole. And I find myself cutting almost uh, into the oncoming southbound olive traffic. Um, it's, it's just very difficult to do. In fact, it's so difficult that the pole at the very west end uh, of, uh, of middle has been knocked down, not by me, but by somebody. And it's now a lot easier to, to make that right turn. Um, so in keeping that in mind, and I'd like to say, please keep that pole down. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, I very strongly uh, prefer option B uh, on attachment F. Uh, it will give uh, cars turning right a nice sharp right turn. Uh, it'll give bicycles and cars turning left their own protected space. So could you please adopt um, option B? Um, second thing I'd like to talk about is uh, the uh, thought about no right turn on red uh, at El Camino. I assume that means um, both uh, eastbound uh, um, uh, middle turning uh, right to go south on uh, El Camino and southbound El Camino to turn right to go west on middle. Um, the traffic is already a nightmare uh, and during rush hour in that intersection and having no right turn on red is gonna make it worse. Uh, the traffic often uh, heading eastbound on middle backs up as far as Blake or even before then Sometimes when I want to go to Safeway, I have to wait two or three traffic lights just to get be able to make my left turn into Safeway. Um, one result of a right turn on red ban, a ban on right turn on red, will be people who are heading east on middle intending to turn right on El Camino. Uh, one of two things is going to happen. We'll either drive through the Shell station at the corner, uh, which is not really that safe thing to do, and is going to annoy the heck out of the Shell, Shell, Shell station owner, or they'll turn right on University as they're approaching uh, El Camino, and they'll go down and then they'll turn left onto either College or Partridge or Cambridge or Harvard, and uh, they'll make a left turn onto those streets and then to go turn right on El Camino. Um, uh, with, with Blake Street being closed, that would be even worse. Um, so I see my time's up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. Um, the second speaker for the night is Ms. Adina Levin. And with that, I think that's all the public commenters in the audience. And then. Hello, uh, good evening, Complete Streets Commissioner and uh, staff, uh, Dean Levin. And um, uh, I uh, live uh, pretty near the uh, project at hand and uh, use that area walking and or bicycling uh, daily, if not more than daily, and um, would, and, and also I'm really excited about this um, project because it is serving, um, you know, so, so many different audiences ranging from children to commuters to the things that I most often use it for with a bicycle are um, going to Safeway, going to Staples, and, um, you know, uh, you know, using the various different um, local businesses. I'm really gratified to see so many people saying that this is improving the safety of cycling. Um, so what I would urge uh, maintaining the bike lanes, and then also given the fact that there has not been a major change or positive change in speeds, looking forward to the traffic calming improvements moving forward. Um, um, I, uh, happened to live off of um, Santa Cruz and I recall very much like there was a fair amount of consternation about the sidewalks and complete streets improvements on Santa Cruz before they went in and now that they went in there are just so many more people um, bicycling and walking on that street and so I, I hope that we are able to uh, move toward that complete street on a uh, permanent basis. Um, and um, also, um, living on a side street, they're often when they're when they're 
activities at a church or the downtown. And sometimes people park on my side street and I am happy that I'm living in a city that has lively activities. And sometimes there are people that I don't know that are parking on my street because we have a vibrant city and we're not a gated community. And that makes me happy. Um, one um, question that I have on um, with regard to the parking, um, I think that, you know, the 90 something percent parked is a real issue and um, looking for solutions is good. Given the fact that the par being parked up is a faction of the factor of the ball game, I'm wondering if there's any overlap between the ball games and when Little House actually needs the space. And if not, then I'm wondering whether there might be an opportunity to do some shared parking where when the Little House doesn't need it, but the ball games do, um, that can be some um, location. And lastly, in terms of the um, right on red for El Camino, I mostly use that intersection as a pedestrian and right on red with El Camino and distracted drivers is really a safety hazard. And that's going to get worse as there are more people like in the new developments and then also using the undercrossing. So I do think that it's an important safety opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for virtual attendees who wish to provide public comment, you may engage the raise hand feature. Or if you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. Um, I see the first speaker, uh, Steve P, and the speaker after that will be uh, Jan Barker. Hi, Hi thank you. <clears throat> and I guess this is the appropriate time now. So I have uh, one uh, request and a couple of observations. Um, one thing about this is uh, for the tenants that live in, along Middle Avenue, you know, there's m probably as many tenants as there are homeowners. And, you know, there should be some sort of accommodation to help them. Many of them, you know, don't have parking uh, in their in their building or have two cars there. So uh, one thing uh, I would propose is maybe somehow an hour limit uh, for this bike lane, say uh, it's active from eight in the morning to eight in night or something like that. Um, just, uh, just by way of example, I know Holly Street in San Carlos, they only have parking at nighttime and during the daylight hours, that's when there's no parking and then cars can get through on, on Holly Street. So, um, but really, the the tenants, a lot of them park on, on Yale Street where I live in, where I live upon, in, and I talk to them, and yeah, they're always complaining about there's nowhere to park, there's nowhere for friends to park, and they have to walk uh, quite a bit of ways uh, from their apartment to get home. Uh, so that's my comment. Uh, a couple observations. Um, you know, I, I hear people talk about like uh, capacity of streets, uh, and in, in particular, like on Yale, Yale Road, Yale Road where I live on. Uh, what that means is, you know, I've lived here in, in Menlo Park uh, since uh, 99. Um, and what that means is there's someone's car in front of my house now. And previously, I would never have a car or anyone's car except my own in the driveway. And, and during the daytime, you, you get guests and, and delivery vans and things like that. But when we're talking about capacity here uh, on these slides, uh, that really has an effect on sort of the quality of life of the people whose houses are on these side streets. Um, you know, uh, these uh, people's cars that you don't know, you may know, um, and they're there all the time now. And it's not the, the same. Uh, last uh, ob observation I have is, um, <clears throat> as, a, as a comment, one thing I, I might want to suggest is that there be like uh, police officers on bicycles to monitor students and other bicyclists and actually give them tickets. Um, not, not monetary tickets, but just notice tickets. Uh, when I was a kid 40 years ago in, in Skokie, Illinois, I, I got a ticket and so did my friends for not stopping at a stop sign on my bicycle. And ever since then, I stop on my bicycle whether uh, at a stop sign, no matter whether there's traffic or not. So I, I think that uh, kids and other bicyclists should also get some education as to what appropriate um, biking etiquette is. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. The next speaker is uh, Jan Barker.
Jen should be able to unmute. Hi, I'm Jan Barker, and I am a Peninsula volunteer and chair of the Little House Committee. I commend the commission on their work, and I'm particularly excited about the change in parking in, in front of Nilon Park. Um, the sadness that I bring to this meeting is that nobody mentioned, you know, seniors and Little House is about seniors and most of our seniors do have some restriction in their ability to get far distances. Um, we also have Rosner House, which is an Alzheimer's daycare center. And so again, we have people with mobility issues. So the more parking you can put in front of Nilon, the better for us, because when there's spillover, it comes back into the parking lot and our seniors can't get parking close enough to the entryway to get into the facility in a safe manner. Um, so my one point of clarification would be, I, you know, would love to see the number of the number of slots we had prior to the pilot, the number we had during the pilot, and now the number we're going to have post pilot in the back end phase. That's all. Thank you, Jen. The next speaker is Peter Olson. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to echo Jam Barker, one of the board members for Peninsula Volunteers. I'm excited to uh, hear that parking is being considered again in front of Neelon Park. I think that will alleviate some of the pressure that we've been seeing over the course of the last few months of this pilot. Um, it is disappointing that tonight through this whole meeting, I've listened to how it impacts the children and not one person has talked about how it impacts seniors in Menlo Park. But again, that being said, um, I do believe that the parking, if we do back in parking in front of Neelon Park, um, that'll help alleviate that issue for Little House. Rosner House is a different issue. Um, we are still struggling to find parking for our participants who have Alzheimer's and dementia. So I would like to see something, uh, a little more focus in that area uh, before we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Seeing no more virtually raised hand. Oh, sorry. Um, we have uh, the next speaker, Ken Kirshner. Good evening. Um, I'm a resident in uh, Allied Arts, just a half a block from Middle Avenue. And so I use Middle Avenue frequently. Um, I am in favor of option A at the intersection of Olive and the uh, west end of uh, Middle. I think that's a low speed conflict intersection. And uh, option B would have the mixing zone happen at a higher speed level. And more modern design is trending towards protected intersections. So as our complete streets networks evolve, I'd like to see us adopt more of a a protected intersection design pattern. I'd also like to compliment uh, the pilot and the way the city's collected data on it. I think it's um, been a great mix of both survey and public and um, online comment opportunities and uh, a hat tip to the city staff for doing a great job on that. I also wanted to say I'm really happy with the daylighting effect. This is uh, the benefit of removing parking, it creates a, um, a clear line of sight and removes visual obstacles for both pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers. And I think that's uh, laudable in, in pursuit of our Vision Zero goals. I'm also really pleased with the stop sign at San Mateo. I think that's been a great uh, traffic calming measure. And uh, I really appreciate um, the effort and look forward to how middle Middle Avenue uh, adjoins with the eventual Middle Plaza tunnel uh, and creating a, a wider complete streets network uh, with El Camino and Alma. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Seeing no more virtually raised hands, I return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and then my, my next thing is, is it okay if we take like a quick five minute break it can be less than that but or just me 
Of course. Five minute break it is.
Hey, uh, thanks again, everyone, for your patience. Uh, so at this point, I will return the meeting back to the chair. Thank you. Um, I think we are um, to the feedback from the commission. So, um, yeah, who wants to go first? You want to do the thing she suggested? Of oh, yes. Um, so if we're going to take it by section, um, should we start at El Camino or start at Olive? Olive. All right, let's start at Olive. Sorry. Maybe we can get Kevin's. Kevin had a series of questions that he wanted our recommendations on. And there were some things that are outside of the scope of the staff report. Like, I don't think you were actually asking us for feedback on the El Camino intersection, right, Kev? Maybe we just go in the order of recommendations. Like, yeah. Um, I'll be first from University of El Camino and then those three. Perfect. Things. Yeah, yeah. Yep, I like that. Okay. I appreciate the order. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, anybody? From Olive to University. Um, Kevin, I must say that um, I, I, I echo the comments of some someone who said in the public comment that they appreciated the collection of data, et cetera, uh, that you did. Um, we, I had as a goal, and you've always had as a goal, the council, the staff, and the commission to, as we said earlier, you know, promote, promote a safe street um, and also anticipate changes that will be coming to middle as we go make the underpass to Burgess, um, which will be significant. So for those reasons, um, I agree. I think that the um, from Olive to University, I would support making the pilot permanent. Um, I do understand and have heard the feedback from people who've had some inconvenience with the parking. And I remember when I live on Santa Cruz and obviously when we installed sidewalks and the parking went away, there were some juggling and um, some change of life, but for the sake of the street um, and for the goals that we want to achieve, I support that recommendation. Quickly on Arbor, um, I did want to comment on that because I've gone, I, I live right very, very close to that. And I've gone down and looked at that on Sundays. And um, and I know we had a comment about that in the uh, public meeting in the park on the 28th as well. So a the slide you showed with like all the percent, the max percent occupancies, um, I, I had a couple of, I had one clarifying question on that, which is when you're seeing that 95% on Arbor um, pop up, there it is, yeah. Um, and that's a maximum percent on, you know, observed times. Is that really primarily around Sunday mornings only? Yes, yeah. that's yeah. primarily Sunday mornings. We have data points um, along other weekdays, time of weekdays, and, and definitely Sunday is the high. The yeah. maximum. Yeah. Because what I observe around that park um, is obviously Fremont has only one side of the street parking on the non, on the residential side. And Arbor has um, street parking on both sides. It's a busy park. It's a beautiful park. It's a big attraction for people with dogs. So, and obviously lots of sports. So um, during the week, not let's say Sunday mornings, I see quite a bit of parking in both Fremont and Arbor. As you can see, you're saying Fremont 50%, which basically means that that entire strip residentially on that residential side is full, right? So, yeah. Oh, is it counting? It, it would be 50% of available space. Oh, so, on the residential yeah, side. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my mistake. No, thank you. But it doesn't surprise me that these numbers are sort of robust because they're, it's a very active park and there are a lot of people around there. And, um, you know, it, those numbers seem what I've observed as well. Um, I'm not, it personally, in my observation, the one thing that makes me feel that safety isn't compromised on Arbor when you've got something like a 95% occupancy on Sunday morning is that there are sidewalks on both sides of the street of Arbor. And there's even, um, it's a type of sidewalks where there's a little bit of um, landscaping and sometimes a tree in between the sidewalk and the road. So it feels quite protected. 
So I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask? Uh, we have a, Opera also has a race crosswalk on serving between Rosener and the church as well. So it certainly adds a layer of comfort to, to Arbor as well. Can I ask a quick clarifying question here that Rosner House is not generally in operation on Sunday mornings at the same time as the church, correct? Okay, thanks. Uh, Kevin, can you bring up the slide where you mentioned the traffic calming measures in that, well, for the whole... I was hoping that you might consider um, perhaps a stop sign at the crosswalk at Arbor uh, so that we have a little more protection for those seniors going into R Rosner House and crossing into the church. You mean the cross? Sorry, you mean the crosswalk across middle? Yes, that that could be a three-way stop. Oh, that one rather than Blake, you mean? In addition, Arbor, Arbor. I think the only thing I would wonder I don't know if that's something that we can talk about. I'd love to hear other people's feedback. I guess the only thing I'd wonder is are the people, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I don't know this for certain, but I would raise the question of are the um, seniors using Ros Rosner House parking on Arbor and crossing? Probably not. They're probably not. I don't driving. think so. I've, I've volunteered at Rosner House and that my sense is that people get dropped off. It's not, it's but not perhaps a. Perhaps if the if the tr my point is if traffic stopped on middle because there are drop-offs and because it's a senior zone and because it's a church zone, maybe the pedestrians that are active in the area and the drop-offs would be safer. Mm -hmm. It's a tr as a traffic calming measure other than a speed bump. Well, this is a, so just to make sure we're talking about all this, the, have all the facts straight and stuff, just, and how, all having the same conversation. Um, this is a speed bump, but it's also the flashing beacons, right? The plan on Arbor is to put in the type of thing where you hit the button and the beacons flash when you want to cross. So I just want to make sure, you know, it's like an enhanced crossing. It's not simply a race crosswalk. Am I correct about that? That's, that's correct. So, yeah. So in this case, we're, rec um, the, the approved concept plan is to have a race crosswalk on the, I guess, the, the right-hand side of Arbor, um, halfway down Jack Lyle Park. And then in addition to the raised crosswalk, you have the flashing beacon, which is- Which is probably far more yeah. expensive to implement than to put a stop sign. <laughs> yes? From a cost standpoint, absolutely. A stop sign compared to the flash beacon, a lot, a lot cheaper to put in a stop sign. But um, but yeah, I, I think in, in this case, the the reason why we we recommended the the race crosswalk usually with a race crosswalk two two benefits one a safer crossing for pedestrians you are now elevated uh, it also serves as a speed hum essentially uh, it being able to kind of slow down cars so in this case we picked this location because you know as you're traveling you know say from Olive towards uh, El Camino you essentially will be kind of slowing down yeah. as you approach Arbor, uh, not not just the Arbor we're looking at right now, but the other Arbor as well. So it kind of has that dual effect of kind of slowing the cars as they approach this race crosswalk and as they exit, obviously. So that's why we picked this location. It serves, you know, both crosswalks as well as we, we recognize that, you know, the uh, player and Arbor on Sundays gets used by the church. So that's a, another benefit for those folks that are using the crosswalk. Um, to get to the church. And then, of course, the, the park itself, getting some benefit of um, slowing down cars in front of the park itself. So you think that's an effective traffic calming measure when it's not reactive to the um, beacons? Yeah, generally, I, I think, yeah, I think generally the, the race crosswalk will do a, a pretty good job of slowing down cars just by itself. And then the, the beacon just kind of highlights more okay. their, their awareness. You know, I, I think since this has been approved already, my recommendation would be to, um, you know, to implement this rather than the stop sign. Um, although we could at least look at the stop sign, we can look at the volumes and see if a stop is warranted. However, um, as I mentioned, the, um, the, the approved concept here would have the benefit of seeing cars slow down as they approach Arbor already. So that, that is one of the benefits of having it um, located where we are, we located. Yeah. What's the assumed timing? The, I'm sorry. What's the assumed timing for the crosswalks and the hops? So for all the for all the traffic calming measures here, uh, we're also hoping for summer of 2025. So with the resurfacing and the traffic calming, 
we're hoping to kind of do that simultaneously as a single project. Yeah. So so maybe I'll um, go ahead. Katie. Actually, can I ask? Sorry, I'm looking at a, an, an overview of of um the like a whatever you call it panor. What is the word for this thing? Sky view, <laughs> satellite view. Thank you, satellite view of, of Arbor Middle right now, and and being reminded about the distance between the arbors, like how it jogs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, maybe you just explained this, and I didn't get it. Why why would we put the I agree. Um, the raised crosswalk at the second arbor mm -hmm. instead of the first one, which is by the daycare, the bus stop, the, there, I, there used to be a bus stop there. There might still be. Um, the, so the church, the daycare, the bus stop, the, you know, the, the sidewalks that, that it seems like if you're going to have one of those two crosswalks, cause right now there are two, mm -hmm. there's, there's one at each arbor intersection. It seems like you'd at least want the one by the bus stop to be the raised one. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I think the, the reason why we picked the current location, is it, it kind of allows us to also control what's going on around Fremont as well. I, I think I, I see your point, certainly. Uh, and, and that arbor is, is kind of a, a secondary benefit versus, I guess, if you put it where, right in front of the church, it becomes a primary. So I, I certainly get um, the, the, um, the feedback right there. The, the, yeah, simply the reason that we're kind of recommending where it is right now is we're trying to capture both to the left and to the right as well, given that it's in front mm -hmm. of the park. So we're trying to kind of broaden the benefit of the entire, I guess, influence area, if you will, rather than just looking at just that arbor crosswalk. I guess if I think about the times when we have the most vehicular traffic there, um, it's not necessarily, aside from people who are actually going to the church, it's not necessarily Sunday mornings. Right. So the during school commute hours, you might actually get more flowing out of that other arbor. Mm -hmm. Okay. The yeah. way I see it so here is that um, the people parking on Arbor and Fremont on the north side are going into the park and the churches, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But that 90% of people who were parking at that 90% max and the arbor on the south side are going across the street. So that's why I thought the, the crosswalk was there. Yeah, and, and plus the uh, the folks that might be using the race crosswalk to actually get to the park versus um, you know going to church on a Sunday, uh, so we're kind of taking that into account as well. But um, this is a conceptual design anyway, right? This is a conceptual yeah, I mean, design. The, the, I mean, not asking for no recommendation off of this tonight. Right? This no, yeah, this is no. We're just I, this is simply to show you point. kind of where we recommend it and what was approved back in uh, 2013 by the city council. How yeah. about Caster? Can I? <laughs> How about I mean, if we really, you know, it's like th th this will significantly contribute to safety, you know, slowing the speed yeah. up. And, you know, 2025 is. Yeah, no, and, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to consolidate this effort with the resurfacing effort as well. One of the things that we're trying not to, um, because one, once you built in the raised crosswalk, um, and then if you start resurfacing the project, that sometimes will. Uh, change the elevation a little sure. bit. So we're, we're trying to make it so that we can have the the maximum benefit, if you will. Um, but I certainly recognize what you're saying. Sense. I mean, what, yeah. what do you think about a high level um, schedule available to the community saying just things like that? Like, I think it's, you know, this is what we're going to repave and this is when we're going to do this and this is when the humps are, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, it may, may already exist, um, may be useful to the city council in May. Yeah, we, we can certainly highlight what we be estimates for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. We we can certainly update the what project website to highlight the yes. dates of, of the elements. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's the right solution. Yeah. Kevin, um, in what? Sorry about that. In what instances can we um, put a no parking versus a no stopping sign? And in what instances can we paint the curb red? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So you know. From a technicality standpoint, no stopping is an added layer to no parking. So no parking generally means you know you can't park your car. It means you 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 once you left the car, the car is parked. But if you're sitting in the car, say waiting for somebody, then technically the no stopping would prevent that from happening. Um, so it's just another added layer. So it's more severe than the it's parking? it's it's a little bit more severe. Yes, I'm sure, that's the message. 
Right. Um, I, I think folks are definitely, uh, we would definitely receive some feedback about, hey, no stopping versus no parking. And we, we that is one message that we have heard. And we, we're going to go back and, and take a look at it and see if there's, uh, if it continues to be an issue, we can certainly explore the the no parking verbiage instead of the no stopping. And how about the um, yeah. red curb? Red curb, that is more of a, um, it, when it comes to red curb or signs, you know, red curb generally costs a little bit more from a maintenance standpoint. It's a little bit more to maintain. Mm -hmm. So from a staff perspective, you know, we, we like to put signs in because, you know, there's less costs associated with the overall timing of it all. Understood. Um, yeah. Thank you. I have a couple of quick questions. I think we're not talking about moving the crosswalk at Arbor anymore, but I just wanted to understand that spot on mm -hmm. whatever side of middle that is south is that um i uh anyway are there crosswalks on that section of middle because i, I think i mean that would be just another reason why to put the cross not crosswalks sidewalks is what i meant sidewalk on the south side of middle near yeah. arbor yeah yeah so I've such that like if you made the crosswalk line up with arbor on the other side that mm -hmm. you'd be putting people walking on theoretically no sidewalks right to get to the crosswalk versus having street level yeah so there's no um something no, ish yeah so there is a sidewalk um uh, not really a sidewalk it's a compacted decomposed granite <laughs> compacted pathway whatever it is uh, around the area um so yeah so okay technically no no sidewalk but there is a walking area that's available right. yeah okay uh, just to, I think the no stopping parking, I had thoughts about it as well. If we're mm -hmm. just to add to that, what, I mean, what I have to say is just looking around town, um, we actually mean no parking because UPS, Amazon, your washing machine repairman, mm -hmm. the plumber, like every one of them are pulling up in front of your house to do whatever it is they need to do wherever it is you live. Like I live in a neighborhood where you can't park in front of anyone's house. And yet that has never stopped Amazon or any of the delivery trucks from seeming to make it. So um, I do think, I don't, I don't know what the rules are around it that we want to do, but I can see that we really do mean no parking because we're not opposed. We we do widely allow stopping. Um, and I, I have thoughts about it, but generally they don't swing their doors out. They're not there for a long period of time. And so the likelihood they're going to impact cars is much less or bikes. Um, so that's sort of my part. Yeah. I would like to support that. Sorry. I'm yelling into this. I would like to support um, what both commissioner King and, and chair Sebrian said. I, I found it really telling in a lot of the feedback that people pointed out how many construction trucks were that basically what people were pointing out is all along middle during this pilot, really the only places that people were completely disregarding um, that they weren't supposed to be parking in bike lanes were on that side of university on middle, um, really mostly between Blake and El Camino, just everyday construction trucks. It, I've been back and forth there all the time. And um and I and I definitely came away with the feeling that the no stopping signs were not that effective. So I went online looking at no parking signs, et cetera, and there are obviously no parking signs that say no parking bike lanes. You know, super clear. Um, and I think we just have to be as absolutely clear as possible because, you know, we can't really say that um, we've made it. You know, back to the goals, right? Like easy to navigate biking and promoting biking, et cetera, if there's this big segment that is just completely ignoring um, the restrictions. So I really agree with that. Um, and I hope we take that seriously. I I don't know if it's an older nomenclature, but no stopping doesn't really register uh, yeah. the same way. <clears throat> I guess procedurally, I guess I'm just curious, like if we're going, cause we want, we're being respectful, I know of of, of uh, the conversation by grouping our comments. So if we look at the front page of the staff report and the first thing you wanted us to comment on was that the staff is recommending that between all the university, 
uh, we make the current um, bike pilot permanent. Um, should can we all? I mean, I'm not saying a motion, but can we all say that? Okay, we've discussed that, and we all have a point of view about that, or we or we do take a motion on that separately, or how do you want to do this? Yeah, I I think I'm certainly appreciate the um any thought process or any any feedback okay. that you have per segment. I I'm, I'm more than happy to. Because right now, I think generally I'm hearing consensus, at least with the Olive to university. Um, perhaps if we move on to I mean, I can make this section right here. And then if there's also a consensus, we can have one single motion that covers the entire corridor. Uh, but if, if as we continue the conversation, it felt like there's a need to kind of separate okay. the two segments, we can do so as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, just to chime in before we, um, while we're still sort of thinking about that olive section, um, in looking at the option A and option B olive and middle intersection, um, oh. like it is true. Most of the bikes are turning left on to olive from middle and, um, uh, most of the cars are turning right. Um, however, I, I personally lean toward option A, and the main reason is that one of the things that these bike lanes have created is um, each time we've added bike lanes somewhere that happens to miraculously be on my commute, um, I like I feel the that reduction in car conflict. Like every time we need to cross lanes, like you, you just, you can hear the cars coming up behind you. Sometimes they'll try and sneak ahead of you. Sometimes you just can hear that whole thing. And sometimes they will just pull in front. And so I find like minimizing those conflict points is key. And I agree with people that if you're having the conflict point earlier in it, like that line backs up and cars get impatient and then they become less good about looking for bikes. Secondarily, I saw a lot of comments. Now, I will say I'm not at this intersection every day, every all the time, but I am there like, you know, super rainy days notwithstanding, 189 days a year, morning and afternoon. Um, since we put the bollards in, I have seen very, like I saw one car try to use the right turn lane, but figure out that they couldn't and stop. I haven't seen any cars try and use it. And in fact, I often have to stop and make it clear to cars that they can go, partly because, as has been mentioned many times, bikes are not very good at stopping at these stop signs. And I think that's a discussion that we definitely need to have. However, I have found that like I actually need to wave cars through. So they are fully aware that there are bikes in this section. What I like about option A is that it creates a much bigger area between where the bikes are queued up and where the cars are queued up so that you're not like sitting right in their rear view mirror space. And so um, it does provide space enough for cars to actually, to really see what bikes are coming up. So option A would be my preference um, for that reason. Um, but I'm certainly- Can I piggyback other off ideas. that? Um, cause I, I, this one was initially not super intuitive to me. I, I don't love the idea of making a right, a left turn across right turning traffic, but, but I also learned how to bike commute in Boston and was mixing it up with cars all the time. And I think I'm an unusual, I'm unusual in that regard. And I, I, I think, um, I, I think it was Ken Kirshner who weighed in that this is in fact the way that bike design is trending. Um, I, when I looked at option B, um, I realized that we already do this somewhere else in the city and it's really annoying because no matter how many times I do, I, I use that intersection. I, if I'm, if I'm not super focused, I, I screw it up. And that is at Santa Cruz by the cemetery. Yep. Um, it is confusing for cyclists who are going straight, which cyclists, cyclists often are, mm -hmm. um, because it's sort of, it makes it, you know, it sort of seems to want to steer all, all bikes into the green lane. And then what happens is you have cyclists who are intending to go straight, who are suddenly to the left of cars that are also going straight. And they're sort of, they're sort of out of phase with, with traffic. Um, and I think that could happen here too, especially when we're talking about kids. 
Kevin, can I ask a couple yeah. of questions about A? Um, is Does A currently have single lane of bollards um, and now it's gonna go to almost a, an island with bollards on both sides? That is correct. So right now what's out there, we have a single row of baller. However, to um, Chair Sibrian's point, you know, after you went in almost immediately, cars were kind of using it. So in this case, we kind of took that into account with option A, kind of staggering the baller. So it's essentially two rows for two purposes. One, making sure that the bike lanes are narrow enough where a car can't go through. Understood. And then also the stacking effect um, would basically prevent cars from going in between the ballers, um, which, you know. Does that double lane of bollards though continue to the right? And will the cyclists have to navigate it? Because in this photo, I see more bollards turning right. Yeah. So the ballers, yeah. So that's a that's a very good question. So we do have more ballers essentially on olive in this case. Uh and, and the purpose behind that is to to really make those right turning cars Keep to up. turn and then um slow, first of all, to turn slowly. But a second of all, um, not being able to cut that turn as you uh, as you if you if you would without the ballers, and and the idea behind that is just really wanted to kind of slow down the cars, but then also square up the cars so they can they have more time to see what's to to their right, and then and then ideally you know as they turn more time um, for them to be able to see a, a bicycle that's coming Does wanting that to make a left. Maintain the width because as the gentleman uh, mentioned, it can. You can get a little close to the answer. Definitely more challenging to to the uh, to the point um, that Mr. Uh, Barclay had mentioned. You know, I, I think from a design standpoint, that that is what you need to do to slow down the cars. Um, you know, it, it does have kind of that reverse effect of you know, if your car is turning fast, then you there's a possibility you're hitting the baller, right? And and then the idea is that you know maybe you hit it the first time, the second time you turn, you realize that, and you slow down as you're making that turn rather than keep going fast and hitting it repeatedly. So, you know, there, there is that effect of, um, you know, us trying to kind of educate the, the drivers a little bit more, kind of forcing them to slow down as well. Because we don't want to run into the situation we ran into at Draeger's where we had the ballers and then we removed them. Right. We have to, yeah. We, so we do have to move them. So, yeah. So it is a, a, a bit of a delicate balance of like, pushing the boundaries, so to speak. And, and we've been kind of learning our lesson as we as we continue to do more of this as well. Yeah, but that point well taken. Um, are we eventually gonna be putting bike lanes on Olive? Mm. I believe we have that in the TMP. I think so too. Yes. So I does that change how this hardscape is developed? I, I don't, for turns and I things like that. Yeah, I just I want to make sure. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, these are just post and striping. Okay. If we need to, we can absolutely redesign it when Olive comes on board, mm -hmm. whenever okay. that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about that part. Okay. Yeah. Also, one more question about this. Um, I know that in other places I've seen with with there where there's more permanent sort of separation of bikes and mm -hmm. and drivers. Yeah. There's sometimes an issue with street cleaning. Happen. Where debris, sticks, leaves, et cetera, can mm -hmm. collect in the bike lane and not get picked up by the street cleaning uh, people. And I think I would hope that the city doesn't do anything that would preclude us from keeping that bike channel clean and debris free. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you brought up a great Somebody point. That in the comments too. Yeah, you, you brought up a great point about using the use of ballers, right? Um, the, the reason why we have one row out there right now, uh, as a matter of fact, besides the separation, is it is wide enough for a, a street cleaning car to go through. But then as you mentioned, now regular cars are going through, yeah. right? Because the space is there. Uh, and in order for us to narrow it enough to prevent a regular car from going through, a street cleaning car would definitely not be able to go through. So that is kind of a struggle that we always constantly kind of battling. And, and we we do rely on our street cleaning crew as well. Um, we have a great street cleaning crew sometimes, and we do have locations where we have ballers where the, the car, the trucks can't get to. And when they get a call, they'll, they'll, they're more than happy to go out there and, and kind of clean up the, the area a little bit. So. so what's the best practice? Because this has got to be something that happens everywhere where people are starting to put in more protected bike lanes. What are, are there, is it, is it a different kind of 
street cleaner? Yeah. Are we going to upgrade our street cleaning? Yeah, I wish I have a silver bullet, but uh, unfortunately it is a matter of, you know, maybe the corner residents taking the liberty of cleaning it up. Or in our case, we have a, we, we typically rely on our street cleaning crew to be able to kind of do that manually sometimes. Um, there are, you know, other traffic calming measures that are not post that we can put that maybe a, a truck can drive through, but then you, you don't have that vertical separation mm. a post would have, right? So that's kind of that trade off there. But at the end of the day, you you are right. It's if the trucks can't go through it, they can't clean it. So we're gonna have to have a plan B to clean that area, whatever that plan B is. The the fire department can make that turn, right? Yeah, but I mean, the fire department will be able to kind of, if they have the siren on, the cars are going to move over. Um, I mean, it's a, it's always stop. The cars are going to move yeah. over. Sometimes, you know, when when it's a location like this, we do tend to design it a little bit tighter. So if a, a yeah. fire truck might have to, you know, maybe uh, turn a wider turn. But but in this case, we have a lot of local streets um, that are super tight for, for fire trucks anyways. Like there's the siren on, cars are going to move over. They'll be able to turn. Yeah. Can I just add one more follow on to that brief discussion about the sweet sweepers while we have that while while the topics out is that um, the over the top uh, the willow overpass mm -hmm. um, those that concrete the really nice fully protected bike lane yep really small doesn't get cleaned very often <laughs> so whatever solution we have we already have the spaces that are ready to be um, addressed with that and um, yeah. I we have something like that on Dumbarton Bridge, right? Like when people ride over Dumbarton Bridge, they get flat tires because mm -hmm. that there's always glass and debris right. in that on that bike crossing, and it's like you have to bring twice as many tubes if you do that ride. Sorry to cut right. you off. The but... last thing I'm going to add for the option A, option B discussion, um, because I forgot to say it before, is um, I sort of remember one of the um, goals of this project at the very start was also around, um, some concerns of cut through traffic. And so, um, in my mind, creating this single lane left and right really makes it a lot less appealing for people trying to cut through to Sand Hill. Um, and so as soon as we switch it back, I think we'll get more of those cars trying to rush their way to Sand Hill. Um, and so, um, I like, I see that line at the stop sign as quite a deterrent for cutting through. And then the next place they would be cutting through is in fact, the road that is five deep with bikes across it every morning. I guess as we're just wrapping up the option A, option B at all of discussion, I will also throw my hat into option A. Agreeing with Commissioner Bruzy that um, uh, especially since we've got kids at the Oak Knoll age, like, you know, really K through five, um, the idea of this conflict point at higher speed and the crossing lanes really, I think, is a mistake. Okay, hey, great. Thank you very much for that feedback here. I appreciate that. Uh, in that case, um, with an eye towards the chair, should we move on to University and El Camino then? Yeah, okay. Oh, University and El Camino? Oh, between University. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> between University and El Camino. The, yeah. the actual recommendation, which is yes. uh, in front of you right now. Yes. And and just um to, uh, sorry, uh, I, I realized I just contradicted myself. Just to kind of answer Commissioner Baruzzi's question a little bit earlier about the turning vehicles. So in the morning, we have approximately 180 cars making a right turn in the morning, 117 making a left. So that's cars. And then for the bikers, oh. 17 making a right, oh, okay. 32 making a left. Okay. It's just to uh, kind of wrap up that conversation earlier too. Okay. So I, I think it goes back to more cars are making a left. I'm sorry, more bikes are making a left, more cars are making the right, that, that conflict area that we've been talking about. I can go. Um, I have some comments on the um, suggestion to pilot the back-end parking at Neyland Park. Um, 
I'm actually in favor of that, um, piloting it. Um, I think that the parallel parking, in my observation, um, hasn't been a successful design approach, partly because from, as you can see here on this sort of bird's eye view, um, my observation is that this somewhat convoluted path we're asking the bikes to flow in here, that goes up and then down, and I don't see them doing that. I see a lot of bikes just biking like right along the cars, uh, between the cars and the lanes, and we don't want that happening. Um, you know, it, especially with that tight space, I just think that's a, a almost like a, a not natural flow uh, for bikes to take, and so people don't take it. So it's it's a bit self defeating. Um, I'm also mindful of the fact that we did have really gotten a lot of feedback around um, the difficulty parking at Elon Park and how important it is in creating these healthy and safe communities for people to be able to use um, parks. Uh, and we know that 30 spaces were lost in the process. We changed to parallel parking and that's not insignificant. Um, I also think, and I just want to raise a hand and say I'm happy to serve on some sort of parking Elon subcommittee if needed to put the time to look into this. But I I walked this area for quite some time just trying to see if there were other opportunities to maximize the number of spaces with the land we have. And just as you all can see right here, one of the things I looked at was right under on this uh, diagram, right under where it says Elon Park, there's sort of a row of bushes along the uh, tennis court. And honestly, if you just remove that row of bushes and straightened out the sidewalk, which all you would really lose is a row of bushes, um, you could even fit more uh, parking there. And that's clearly where people really want the parking because we're having trouble getting them to go around the back and park a little house. So that's obviously the most convenient, but it seems to me a better use of space. Obviously you'd be moving a sidewalk and that would potentially have some costs, but um, it's an ideal, ideas like that. Also, um, you know, I'd written you about this one, Kevin, because I wasn't sure, but if you go up that driveway um, that goes back to Little House, you'll see on the right are the tennis courts. On the left is this kind of like a few trees and some grass, and turns out the city owns that strip. And I was suggesting that we look into maybe some parallel parking along there if possible. And I just took some photos I can share, but I I do think that there, and I'll, I'm sorry, the other thing was, I know we've talked about restriping some aspects of the little house uh, parking lot uh, to maximize number of spaces and and also in that strip along the tennis court. And it really looks like there's some possibilities there. So I think what I would really suggest is to maximize the real estate we're already devoting to parking to really accommodate those people. Um, of course, you know, ideally everyone bikes to a park, but you know, when I was a single mom raising my son and everything else, like absolutely did myself or the nanny once, you know, or whoever, you know, childcare take the car and it was just easier with all the stuff, you know, where you've got four kids and you know, you're getting, we're going to, people are going to use cars to go to this park. Um, so that is my suggestions around Nilon. And then I know Liz had some around uh, parking signs. If you mm -hmm. want to talk about that around Nilon. Yeah. The, um, there's two existing parking signs uh, uh, when you go both directions on middle pointing into the parking by the tennis courts, but they're very skewed with this kind of angular and it almost looks like go further down and you'll find some parking, not turn, make a left turn here or a right turn here and you'll find it. Can we enhance that signage? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that was one uh, another feedback that we have received a uh, couple of times already as well. So that is definitely something that we're going to look into to further enhance the the parking signage, indicating that there is that parking lot for Neilon Park. Yes, that is yeah. absolutely something that's yeah. on our radar. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you could even have a Neilon Park sign there, um, facing. So here's what's going to happen. That's a good idea. When you the the Back in diagonal parking is going to work for people coming from El Camino, mm -hmm. but coming from the other direction, you need a sign facing people who are heading down towards Safeway on Middle. That's like a big, "Hey, Neil on Park, right here, here, mm -hmm. yes, this way." Mm -hmm. Like right. you know, so the angled toward people so that it's super, super clear. Mm -hmm. This is where this is where you go if you're coming in this direction. And I noted that there's been concern about U turns in the middle of the of the street there. And I know that that's something that Stanford has been trying to out forbid where they've been doing the back end parking over by the dish. Yeah. And I wanted to throw out the idea that while we're piloting it, could we also throw in some 
flexible bollards or a temporary median in front of that section on middle to really say no serious what like what we have over on Oak Grove or on or yeah. at the Alma Ravenswood intersection to just say no serious like no don't don't do something janky where you're coming this way and then pulling a U-turn and then you know endangering people in the process but but just you know if you're coming from the west go into the go into the driveway if you're coming from the east do the careful back end thing um I think that'll help people have a sense of what they're meant to do and what they're not meant to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we definitely thought about that. And and like I mentioned, we, we definitely going to try our best to highlight the, the act, the accessibility or the availability uh, of the parking lot in the back as well. Uh, we, we did thought about the, uh, the baller idea um, while it, it will prevent the cars from making a left. It also will essentially preclude the residents from coming out and making a left from the driveway. Um, it's about, I want to say 10 to 11 houses that will be essentially okay. eliminating right. that. So yeah. Thank you for, yes. Right. I generally think this is a good idea, but I'm just kind of worried just a little bit about the logistics of somebody going um, up middle. And then as I watch people at the dish, what they do is they kind of go out into the oncoming lane to back up, right? So if you're going um, west on middle and you're gonna go into the, I assume the diagonal is gonna point up middle. Um, the car is gonna go kind of cross, uh, it depends on how much space. My question is how much space, will the car actually cross the dividing line to back up or will it stay in its lane? You understand my question? This is, yeah. a, this is a great question. It's right. a great question, Brian. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. The second part of it is the other direction. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody's going um, east on Mill and says, oh, there's the park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they would have to go down. They'd probably make a U-turn on one of those uh, little streets there. So those residents you know, we'll see a lot more of U-turns happening there. Or they need to go all the way down El Camino then come up college and then somehow go to get onto El Camino so they could go up middle, right? So it's a big, which is the same problem you have with the dish, right? If you try to, if you miss it. So is what, just talk me through that. Uh, you know, those, those two issues. Yeah, uh, no, I, I think those are Great points. Uh, the first one, I think we're, we're comfortable, we're confident that that you do not need to go into the opposing lane. Uh, the reason is, you know, the, um, we're essentially designing it with a um, a 45 degree angle where it's going to be easy to navigate as you back in. Additionally, because of the fact that we're now kind of shifting the bike lane, you essentially would kind of, you also have that kind of additional area to kind of navigate a little bit more. Too. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, a, a, essentially kind of a little bit of that buffer zone for you to be able to navigate. So we're, com we're confident that you do not need to uh, go, I, I see what you're saying, so go be, into be, the opposing be, lane in order be, to back in more comfortably. Yeah. So, well, however it's done. It'll be right. Better, yeah. So somebody's not. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to your second point, I, I think it, it's point well taken and I do believe that it probably would happen as well. You know, um, I think even prior to us, even prior to the pilot, one of the feedback that we got from uh, from Blake was people are doing that. People are essentially using Blake to make that U turn, yeah, right? Exactly. So so now you're using Maori or Kenwood instead of uh, instead of um, mm -hmm. instead of Blake. So uh, recognize that you will continue. You likely will be an issue, and that's why to uh, Commissioner King's point, we want to do everything we can to highlight that driveway. Yeah. Making sure folks that are coming eastbound know that hey you and we'll have we'll, we'll look we'll look into advanced signs as well, not just at the driveway, but maybe even before the driveway. Wow. As you approach university, you know that it's coming. Give yourself a little bit of time to make that left too. So yeah, I think that'd yeah. be really great because it's yeah. it, it's almost like um, people are going east on middle and they see the sign, you know, uh, parking lot previous exit. You know, so, <laughs> um, so if it Absolutely. Moved, moved up and made larger. Absolutely. And, and yeah. something. Um, yeah. The, the third point um, is that, you know, that Safeway exit is really backing up traffic mm -hmm. there. And a lot of times that traffic will back up almost to Nilon 
right? So this additional congestion about people, you know, uh, missing it, right? Um, and then going down, making U-turns or just the people slowing to, you know, to back in mm -hmm. is going to, I think, maybe uh, maybe it's worth taking a look at what the effect will be in terms of backed up cars. Mm -hmm. um, because that, if people are going to be riding bikes at that Safeway exit, mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of things happening there, yeah, that's going to be a concern, I think. Yeah, no, I I, th I think you you brought up a, a, a very good point there, and 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 that's partially the reason why we're recommending this as a pilot. It allows us to kind of observe that interaction that you mentioned, uh, and then see if there's any additional tweaking necessary. I I I, I take it to your point about you know the the queuing and and then the, the fact that if you want to back in, you kind of have to slow down as you approach middle, come to a stop, and then back in, and then so you're kind of creating that queue. I think noted with that for sure. Yeah. yeah. I just generally think whatever we could do to enhance parking in the back. Yeah. It just seems like way safer to me, just generally and easier to unload. And it's additional 23 yeah. steps to get to the swing. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, and I think the back end design kind of inherently also is going to make that you know, kind of shortening that timing, if you will, right? Kind of easier for you to back in versus right now you're doing parallel parking. Some folks are, you know, much better at it than, than others. Uh, but I think the back end will kind of shorten that the amount of time necessary for you to be be on middle too, so. Yeah, this doesn't really materially change. Like we're sort of having them do a different kind of parallel parking effectively, right? I mean, nothing else is changing about the conditions except that there are more spots there more spots probably a little easier to park would be my guess yeah um parallel versus back in i think folks probably more comfortable with uh, I'm, I'm just kind of speaking from personal experience but, but, as well. but with <laughs> yeah i guess so i just yeah. think with the parallel parking you're actually in the driver's lane in the in the travel lane mm -hmm. yeah right can i yeah. can i ask a quick i this must be the like silliest question ever but like what stops them from pulling in face first? The, like those cars that are heading towards El Camino, like what stops them from just pulling in uh, the normal way? Signage? Yeah, Is there that, a that's, thing a, that's a great that question. We, we, we can have additional signs um, to kind of tell them, to alert them not to, but okay. I, th I think that's to the point of Commissioner Bruzzi's about, hey, maybe some ballers in the middle right. would have done the trick. Um, but unfortunately the, the driveways kind of make that a little impossible to do, but would but, it yeah. be painted in the parking spots, rear parking only? We, we're going to, we're going to have um, signs that kind of demonstrate how we're going to have educational signs that demonstrate how to do the back end, but those will be facing the proper facing of so westbound yes. vehicles. Okay. Right. So you're talking about you know the eastbound folks, maybe a sign that tells them not to make a left turn. I don't know. Is holding it, into the parking but spot. Is the painting on the on the pavement a possibility? Um, we could explore that. Right now, that's not it's um expensive. that's not the case because because essentially you you want a message that says don't pull in, right? Well, you would want it rear parking only right or rear parking only and then so doing that for every single spot Fair. and then and oh, then also you'll basically be facing the person that's pulling in okay understood i mean we can look into that i'm, I'm not i'm not sure if there are well, options out there their signage is well. right I, I think signage obviously will help for sure uh, my my a little consternation with that is the sidewalk is relatively narrow right now so um, adding signs and poles, it, it's going to be tricky. Not that it can't be done, but tricky. Okay. Um, I have one more question about this, uh, looking at the parking configuration. Um, part of me, like certainly the question has come up about, um, I see it's the same number of handicap spaces as we had before mm -hmm. um, or as what we have right now. I don't know what was there before. Before was three as well. Okay. Yeah. And, and have we found that that is enough. Um, part of me looks at this and sees like maybe there's better opportunity to create more handicap parking so that the people who really need the easier access to these things, like, you know, to the concerns that have come up about making sure people with more limited mobility 
are getting access, like, do we know that we have enough spaces for people there? Yeah, I, I think anecdotally, I have heard uh, from a few folks that they could probably use more ADA spaces. I'm, I'm not sure exactly whether, um, because there are also ADA spaces in the back where little houses too. Um, mm. I, I think one of the challenge, and, and this basically is the same challenge for all configurations right now, doesn't matter which one you choose, is... Uh, in, in order to have more ADA spaces, you need to have the access route and the, the curb ramp, et cetera. So not that it can't be done, it's just it's gonna be added layers to to um to the to the equation. So but I, I think one of the things that we could as part of the pilot, uh, again, going back to the reason for doing a pilot, if we felt like there's um a need for more ADA spaces, we can certainly take that into account as we um recommend a permanent solution in the near future as well. Yeah. Okay. And then my last question about this whole, this parking thing at Nilan, um, I think I, if other people have brought it up, like certainly looking at the restriping. And I also was looking at that whole long line of barricades telling you not to park um, and thinking like, wow, well, you could totally parallel park there. Um, so, um, and then the other thing that came up was the like, on we don't we don't control how long people park in these parking lots and so um it is an interesting problem to have that we seemingly have some long-term parkers who are parking in that parking lot and so we're changing our configuration in front of the park and um you know and and giving bikes a less preferable option because we, because we have these long-term parkers in the parking lot that are taking up spaces. And so it's just interesting how we're shifting the risk to bicycles um, instead of figuring out how to make sure that the parking lot is available for public park users. Can I respond to that? Yeah. Cause I was thinking about this. Um, and I, and I, I know that there've been people who've been excited about, Oh, you know, Menlo Park's first protected, you know, parking protected bike lane. Um, even though it doesn't work for everybody, obviously. Um, but that's not the standard that we've had in the city elsewhere. So I know there are people who don't want to bike places unless they're in a protected bike lane, but giving them, you know, a few hundred feet of protected bike lane in one place in our city isn't going to make their lives better because as soon as they get out of that protected section, they're in the normal buffered bike space. So I don't think it really, I don't, I'm not surprised that it, we haven't suddenly added a whole new generation of cyclists that are really scared except for protected bike lanes, right? We, we, that's not what we have in 95% of the places around our city. So I don't think, I think it's like sort of an anomaly. And, and I do think that, yeah, there are probably some people who live in apartments in the area who have been using the parking lot to store vehicles, but we've already inconvenienced people by asking them not to store their vehicles in a place where we want people to be able to bike. So I think that's, I think nobody gets everything they want. You know, yeah. some people get to have a pretty safe bike lane that isn't maybe Amsterdam standard, um, but, you know, takes advantage of the available hardscape that we have. And um, hopefully when more people, when we complete our bike network and add the undercrossing, there will be more people using it. And one of the things that does seem to add the safety is numbers. You know, when you have a lot more people cycling, it's they're more visible and people are expecting them. So I I definitely get people's excitement about the sort of the glimmer of like, oh, parking protected bike lane. Um, but I I like the trade-off actually of trying the the back end pilot. Um and just, you know, someday maybe we'll get to Amsterdam. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I like, it is interesting. And I think that we should, um, I, I agree. We should definitely, um, try it out. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, you want to go? Yes, of course. Oh, okay. yeah, Approximately well, what's the cost to do this? So, I mean, is it, it's, it's just lines and stuff, or is it actually some, um, some, um, the, the cost to, to do the pilot? Yeah, in this exactly. case, just, right. yeah. So we essentially would have to remove the um, 
remove the ballers that we have out there right now. We'll, we'll make sure to repurpose them elsewhere. We're not going to throw them away. Don't worry. <laughs> Just a couple points. To <laughs> right. They're quite expensive. So we're definitely going to keep them for other purposes as well. But but yeah, to your point, yes, it's essentially going to be um, blacking out lines, adding new lines in. Um, and we're going to do this with paint. Um, so it'll be relatively low cost. Um, yeah. On the, on the point of uh, the fact that we have inconvenienced people who traditionally park in that street and, out, and those houses along uh, middle from the University to El Camino, I think that we should consider decommissioning the pilot at Blake and opening that street up. Given that the circulation issue you mentioned in your report and the 20% occupancy levels, that we need to meet the needs of people going to the park, living in the neighborhood, and open the street back up. I can come in. Yes. I agree with that. Um, I know that would be disappointing to some people, but in my observation, and certainly over the weekend, I spent several hours around Elon, like, I think that the flashing beacon at that crosswalk has just made a world of difference mm -hmm. and with the raised crosswalk even more. So I struggle with the closure of Blake because I don't know that it, it makes sort of the neighborhood at large, excuse me, um, more safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a lot of people, and I also know that we've had feedback that it has impeded um, some circulation. And there's one interesting um, email today that got me thinking also in the, city council inbox, um, which I think was, had made some legitimate, some good points around, well, I guess the way I'd phrase it is that I don't think you close the street lightly mm -hmm. um, because it affects a lot of things like circulation, et cetera. And also in this case, it, there are other streets you could sort of argue qualify for that treatment, but we can't do this with a lot of streets. <laughs> Um, so it almost becomes why single out that street for that treatment when we can't do it for others that are, you know, maybe not positioned exactly there, but certainly you could argue like Yale or something, right? Is a street that goes all the way back. And a lot of people probably use it to walk toward the park or an arbor, right? Yeah. Um, so I think for that reason, it's, it's, um, I, I think that if we're thinking about all the users of middle and the circulation and the benefit of all, then it, it I don't see the, a strong argument for keeping Blake closed. No. Could, could Sorry, Kevin, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure it out on street view and I feel like I should know this, but are there sidewalks across the street from Neilon Park on that section between University and Blake? Is there a is there a continuous sidewalk? So if I'm a parent walking with my kids or biking with my three year old uh -huh. from Partridge, and I want to safely get them to Neilon Park without having to get in the minivan, uh -huh. do I have an off street walking option? Like, because the university is more heavily trafficked than right. Blake, and I I know there I, I one I heard from one parent anecdotally that they use you know, that they and a lot of parents they know use that section, that Blake to get with their kids mm -hmm. to the park. Mm -hmm. I don't think they live on college. So I think they're probably doing something where they go up to university and then down college. But yeah. So I guess my question is, do they do that because there's not a safe sidewalk route along university and middle or and that, and if you're going to walk not on a sidewalk, then it's better to walk not on a sidewalk on a really low traffic street. Is there, Kevin? Is there sidewalk that whole stretch on 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 middle? Uh, yeah, the sidewalk, the sidewalk in middle, yeah. not on size, and not on university, right? No, not on university. Could we put up the map? I think it, that was slide three, maybe. Let's see, Max. No, what slide was that? Um. Yeah, three. Three had a map where you could sort of, oh, well, it wasn't the best map, but it, yeah, see how, sorry. With this map, you can see that Blake, that cut through. I could see the, see how college, mm -hmm. people in college, I could see using Blake there to go to the park, but it doesn't cut through to the other streets like Partridge and Cambridge.
Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, but. Yeah. The other interesting thing is that, that parking along Blake is actually permit only. Permit to the residents. It's a resident. The, the residents who yeah. we took the parking yeah. off of yeah. on middle. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. Huh. So that's who you would get parking there is the people that we've removed the parking from on middle. But what, what was happening is the people at the park were parking on Blake. So so, well, so you're think, saying two different things. You're saying that people who are using Milan can't park on Blake. No, that's not true. Yeah, you, you cannot park on Blake because uh, Blake permitted. is permitted. Yeah. And that's the only block that's permitted. No, no the, the entire LIR, most of the LIR permitted. is a permitted parking program. So yeah, then including if Blake. there's no public parking on Blake, they already have quite a bit of protection from they, right. the pro the problem was they were parking there from Nilon. Right. And then if you have to make a U turn to go all the way around the back and they'll, they'll probably park there some more. So what they were doing is a lot of people that were going to Nilon were parking on Blake. So to me that's not the okay, so that's actually if that's the issue, that's a problem we're trying to solve for. Right. then I don't think closing the street is the right solution. I mean, that's about the most extreme solution you could get to. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the closure doesn't really have anything to do with parking. The The closure is it's really more about Blake essentially being one of the more accessible points for the LR so area. Safe, safe crossing point. For, mm -hmm. Yes, for the crossing, folks like to well, they walk along Blake and then Blake okay. being kind of uh, right. essentially a cut through that's kind of why we're talking about this right now too so you kind of more cars are using blake as a cut through it's being used by pet and bike as kind of one of the main entry points for for Nilan park um and, and those combinations are the reasons why why we essentially supported the temporary closure mm -hmm. and then i think to your point about and and i think i know this is kind of a little counterintuitive if you will but the way that blake is situated does make it easier for the closure because essentially you're pushing away the cut through traffics onto El Camino. You're pushing the cut through traffics onto university where we want them to be versus if there were two parallel streets along Blake. Like so for example, like Arbor and Fremont, if you were to close off Arbor, Fremont is going to feel the blunt of it all. But and, you highlighted and it is a circulation issue. Right. The circulation is essentially folks can't get into LIR with the cars using Blake. They have to go down to a university or go up to El Camino. The, the, the other thing that was happening, um, I don't have any statistics on this, but um, since Middle itself was backing up at Safeway, mm -hmm. people were making a preemptive preemptive right turn down Blake. Uh, down Blake, yeah. And then down college. Y yes. And that so that, that is one of the... Then there you have kids cut throughs. trying to get to the park. Yep. And then there's it just, that that's that all contributed to that kind of problem. right yeah that 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 that's the reason for the closure not because of the parking parking doesn't really have a um it's not really that factor in in this case because of the fact that it's permitted can i bring up a question about this the backup from el camino i know that's sure. not really inside the scope of our discussion yeah. and it's a signal we don't control but it seems to me as we go forward with our planning and figure out what is coming next for this, mm -hmm. that at the very least, that light needs to be longer because it doesn't reflect how much more pedestrian traffic is crossing that crosswalk. So you used to be able to empty metal mm -hmm. pretty easily and it's not happening now. Um, and so like, uh, and I find that like maybe four or five cars get through and then the rest of the line waits for the next round. And then, so I think that is leading to quite a bit of backup because there's just a lot more, um, pedestrian traffic on that crosswalk. And I would expect that that is only going to increase. So, um, it, it would help to make the light longer for cars now um, and not wait until we redo the entire thing. But uh, that's where I see some of that so um, exactly backup right. coming from. Also, the, the, um, people making a left off of middle onto El Camino, right? So they're coming down right. middle, making a left. The pedestrians, as they walk across, somebody's going to get clipped. 
there because yeah. people are looking to the right, waiting waiting for somebody to run the red light. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're stacked up there, um, and then they stack up 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 middle. So the timing of that is almost like it needs a pedestrian only crossing or something. Or only. Yeah, it, it's well. I think Chair Sabrian mentioned that, and anything we want to do there, it's going to require uh, approval from Caltrans, and we're, we're certainly working on a, on the back end to to alleviate some of the issues that 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 is being mentioned here, and those conflict points between pedestrians and turning vehicles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in my experience on this commission, we've had so many discussions about so many streets, and the only time I've ever heard a proposal, aside from Blake, to mm -hmm. actually close a section of a street was Coleman, which has so much more traffic conflicting with a tremendous amount of kids mm -hmm. trying to get to MA and Upper Laurel, et cetera. It's a completely different situation, and it took them years of thinking to finally come up with, should we possibly close this street? Mm -hmm. I don't think street closures are the kinds of things that we can do often, and we should only do them in the rarest of circumstances. If there's a concern of the people on Blake who already have the permit parking that, you know, they wanted this one block to be a, a quiet, peaceful walk into the park, which I understand protected in the way that they want it to be closed off, it feels to me like the way to address those types of issues are through a sidewalk, you know, then lobbying for building a sidewalk on both sides or one side, mm -hmm. you know, depending on how much, um, you know, parking utilization they have. So I would propose actually really actually coming up with a solution that addresses the issue they're trying to solve for rather than closing the street. Was the issue also that there were a lot of turning movements from Blake onto middle that were conflicting with the crosswalk? Um, um, I'm, I was yes. trying to go back and see what people had written us about Blake in the past. And, and I mean, I'm sympathetic to wanting that crosswalk to feel safe, mm -hmm. but I do think closing a street off is kind of extreme. We don't do that very often and it does kind of affect circulation and it seems to benefit one block of people plus the people who like to walk on that in the street maybe at the expense of lots of other people. And it, I could see this becoming like an epidemic of street closure requests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not great. Yeah, no, I, I think those are definitely good points that you brought up. I mean, the closure of any street is, is a big impact. And that's why I, I say sort of in a weird way, this street makes it easier because of the fact that we're pushing the cut through traffic to the roads where they are supposed to be on, right? They're supposed to be on the university. They're supposed to be on El Camino. If you want to stay on El Camino, you're supposed to go down middle and get on El Camino, not cut through Blake and then college. So, but but uh, I'm just trying to basically say there's a lot of considering whenever we get a closure, like uh, even speed hum request, mm -hmm. the first thing we look at is if this goes in, what happens to the next streets, right? What what's the burden that is being laid upon by those other neighborhood streets, right? So and 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 that quickly kind of expands the scope of, of analysis area, if you will. Where where in this case, essentially closing off Blake, you're forcing cars onto University, where it is a collector, Al Camino, where it's Al Camino, obviously. Um, but so also so that's probably why. Partridge, right? Instead of college. Right. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. College. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. Right. College connecting college and then Partridge doesn't have a connection. So oh, okay. in, in a weird way, I think the, the way that it's the configuration of it all makes it easier to, for the, for the closure to, to make sense and not, not have a major impact on other folk on other residential streets. Uh, and uh, I, I know it's counterintuitive, you know, in a way, and I'm hoping, hopefully, I'm kind of explaining that correctly or explain it as as clearly as I could. Um, but then again, I, I'm not I'm not arguing either way. I'm just sharing the opinions that led to us um, with the uh, the recommendation of the closure. But that is the pilot. That is a pilot. It's a temporary pilot. Yes, it's a temporary. And I think it really needs to be evaluated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just wrote down more data, question mark, and I would turn that question to you, which is, do you feel that you need more data about this? To Personally, I, I mean, again, because of the, the where we're pushing those cut-through traffics to, 
it, I've, it doesn't feel like it's anything that that is warranted. But again, if, if if you're cutting, if you're trying to get to Al Camino and you're using Blake as a cut through, then you you need to stay on middle, right? I, I recognize the uh, the inconvenience that is creating to the LA art residents where they might want to use Blake as a cut through to get to the neighborhood. That part I completely understand. And they do have to now go to university or El Camino. That part I completely understand that. But in terms of the configuration, you know, you the the impact is really folks that are on college, right? If you if you try to get to college, you could use Blake. Uh, but if you're not getting on college, you're simply using Blake as a cut through to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That's part of the cut through traffic that you know we typically try to avoid, anyways, right? So the 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 resident that are being impacted in this case would be the folks that are actually living on college because they now no longer have access to Blake. You know, though, all of these are residential streets. Mm -hmm. And so I feel a little weird talking about cut through traffic. Like did Blake people, you know, did they, did they buy the premium membership to Menlo Park where they get to not have cut through traffic, but people on middle and university and college get, do you get to have it? I mean, point, point taken. like, look, some point taken. old street models where you just basically built grids, which mm -hmm. you still see in a lot of Palo Alto, you know, the traffic is just supposed to distribute and mm -hmm. it feels, I know, I know there's this old traffic engineer idea of like, you know, arterials and collectors and yada, yada, yada. But that tends to yield really busy, unpleasant streets. And it has some downstream effects that aren't super positive. Right. Um, and so if there were really, you know, demonstrably dangerous conditions on Blake where we were seeing just sort of really unusual behavior, mm -hmm. um, I, I totally get the convenience of mm -hmm. having a really quiet street for yep. one block. Um, I just, I worry about the precedent. Understood. And I think I would echo the yep. request for more data and people live on middle too, you know, yep. and they live on university and none of, and, and many of these streets don't have sidewalks. So yeah, I know it's across from a park. Um, I, I just I was still wondering if I live on Partridge, why would I why would I walk down College and go Blake instead of walking down University and yeah. and go to Middle where there's a sidewalk? Yeah. Is it just because there's so much more traffic on University and Middle and it just feels less pleasant? Yeah. 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 Plus, I, I'm just anecdotal. The the sidewalks are pretty narrow along Middle as well, so I don't know if that plays a factor. Yeah, I just I'm I'm a little uncomfortable yeah. with uh, uh, yeah. that decision. Mm -hmm. Happy happy to take that as a, a feedback. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I did have one more thing on Nilon parking because we switched over uh, to Blake. Um, so when we were looking at that map, and I was talking about removing the bushes and everything, one thing to build on the point that Commissioner Almond was making about. Um, I, I, about sort of utilizing, thank you, utilize, there's actually, where you see the bike lanes crossing over now on those black asphalt spaces, mm -hmm. it's deep. It's a deep space. And so mm -hmm. the extent to which I would say like moving those parking spaces deeply back in as much as possible to give as much buffer as possible to the bike lane there going by, mm -hmm. I think there's room to do that. And I think that that will alleviate a lot of safety concerns about the bikes being up against the vehicle lanes. Um, and again, two cents is I definitely would take away those bushes. I don't think anyone's going to think, you know, remember they were even there. And it just provides um, more depth to push the whole thing back and better use of space. Yeah. And we can talk to our um, parks folks about the, the bushes, see if there's anything that we're not seeing um, right now. Usually I, you know, I, I learned my lesson of, just because it's there and it doesn't seem like there's no reason for it doesn't mean that's the case. Okay. So uh, I'll reach out to our parks folks, make sure that there's uh, you know, there's no deeper meaning to or deeper purpose to having those bushes okay. there. Yeah. The the last thing I think I would add as I just like for this stretch of road, and again, like my experience isn't everyone's, but as I think about the way traffic flows, like this stretch of middle avenue bike lanes from el camino to university i wonder if it get like 
I never ride that stretch of road heading west because Menlo, right? If you're coming from over the tracks, you're not going to go down El Camino and then pick up middle. So you take Menlo to university, Mm -hmm. which then takes you to middle. So it does cut out. I only started going down this stretch of middle on the way home when we added those new bike lanes because it was better than going up Roble anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, so that may account for the people who aren't seeing as many bikes use that. Mm -hmm. I would say that after we do this pilot, when that undercrossing goes in, like that's going to be a game changer. And that I think is where it's going to make sense for more. That's when I'm going to start using that section. So, um, Kevin, I wonder if you could pull up the, um, I had one more concern, uh, the traffic calming measures for this stretch. Um, and when I was reading through the comments, um, it is for the bicyclist, uh, traveling westbound on middle approaching university. There's currently some bollards separating them, but they don't go all the way to the intersection. So um, they kind of cut off, uh, I don't know how many feet ahead. And some of the cyclists are concerned and complaining about uh, a car making a right turn too quickly and too hazardously. So I wonder if you can consider uh, bringing those bollards closer to the intersection so they're a little more protected. So s- similar to what we have at uh, Olive right now, yes, basically. Yes. Gotcha. Was there something, I, I recall seeing somewhere a thing about the stopping right turns on reds. Is that not part of our discussion? That was added. The, or was you that... mean the no right turn on red at Al Camino in middle? Yeah. Yeah, that's not, I mean, that's just to say, um, letting you know that that's something we're looking into. It's, it. Yeah, it's not okay. part of the conversation tonight. Okay, yeah. then I don't have anything to say about it. You had asked us about Yale, yeah, um, about the crossing at Yale, and you wanted to know if we had thoughts about that, right? Or that was in the staff report? Uh, no, we were just kind of letting you guys know that we're going to continue to observe Yale um, because of the fact that it's serving the apartment folks as well. And we're getting quite a few feedback about some of the interreactions there. We're not looking necessarily looking for feedback, um, but we're just letting you know that uh, unless you guys have a feedback, more than happy to take it. But one one of the main um, component for highlighting that is to let you guys know that we will continue to to observe and, and see how the interreaction goes and then making um, make any necessary improvements to make that crossing a little better. I went to go check it out yesterday and I didn't see a ton of cars parked on that first block of Yale between college and university. Right. There were a couple and there was one with a sign on it from a neighbor who didn't like the car being parked where that, where it was. <laughs> um, I think they were uncomfortable with the, um, how close the driver had parked to her driveway, mm-hmm. um, you yeah. know, to get back to our sight distance issues. Um, but it, there seemed to be a lot of capacity. <laughs> Yeah, and and we're kind of highlighting Yale just because it, it kind of came up a few times. Um, this is almost like a, a test case, if you will, for other locations as well. Um, you know, because essentially it's just kind of this similar in nature where folks are parking on the cross streets, possibly having to cross middle to get to wherever so they want to go. So that's not permit parking only, like Blake is. Uh, Yale is not. Yeah, Yale is just regular parking. Yeah, and then because. Because it's serving the apartments, they also have overnight parking permits, mm-hmm. so they could so they park on have, Yale, so cross, and then get to get to the apartments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a little bit unique compared to other cross streets because of who they serve. Mm-hmm. I just. I have something, but I can say that Jack didn't do it. Uh, that's my next question is what you motion in a second to recommend a per- preferred design yeah so definitely uh happy to accept an motion from the commission here uh, again the the recommendation in front of you tonight we have two main major main segments um dividing middle into two main segments all of the university we're recommending the existing pilot be made permanent and then the section between University and Al Camino Real uh, reconfigure Nilan frontage into back in as a pilot. 
and then the rest of the section made permanent as is currently out there. So um, that, that's our recommendation in front of the commission tonight. And then if the commission wants to make a motion, happy to entertain that too. And all the other feedback, the really great feedback we yeah. gave about yeah. flying uh, sorry. and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I have the I have the list right here. Sorry, I, I did not imply to uh, Well, I don't to, know if I should be included in the motion or not. I, I defer to all you guys, but there was some good stuff. Yeah, I typically will include that as part of the minute. Uh, the the general review will be a, a recommendation, so we'll be and if you don't, Sally will talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you I have no doubt our advice chair will be more than happy. Well, I to want. I really out. like. I think no, I we all put that. our heart and soul into this. We think a lot about these streets, and we have, I think, some good suggestions. So um, no, I, I I'm happy to correct your minutes. <laughs> I I am speaking truly that that happy to. How about accept if I summarize all the good ideas? Yeah. Just no, absolutely. Take a moment. Yeah, we okay. can we can definitely do that. Uh, some of the good ideas tonight that were discussed were um, taking a look at the no stopping signs and considering maybe signs that say no parking bike lane instead. Mm -hmm. um, the other things that came up were, um, sorry. Um, oh yes, uh, ensuring that in the design of the Nilon back in parking, we've pushed cars back as much as possible to ensure that parkers won't be pulling into the other lane to back in. Um, looking at ways to maximize parking spaces, including considering restriping the little house and the driveway that gets up to it, um, maybe even removing the bushes. We had better signage at the driveway, especially really promote parking in the back. Uh, we had checked the ADA numbers, the spaces, um, see if they're appropriate. Um, I had big Nealon Park sign eastbound. I think you said that, Commissioner Bruzy. Um, those were some of our fabulous ideas. And then I believe we also, which doesn't have to be in the motion, I don't think, but we did discuss the preference for option A mm -hmm. at Olive. We um, appreciated that you're going to look further into safety at Yale Road. I will say I observed at Yale Road at night that the light there is like in a tree now. Yeah, we, we noticed that as yeah. well. We're going to take some appropriate action to make sure the light is yeah. functional and uh, hopefully as clear of any tree obstruction as possible. Yeah, because yeah. someone did mention that, that it was dark at night when they mm -hmm. were carrying groceries. And, yep. Yep. and then we also uh, discussed in re response to your request for feedback about circulation, we discussed some things about Blake. Um, and I think that was what we had. If anyone else if I missed anything? Can I ask one follow-up question on our earlier sidewalk discussion? Um, is it is the sidewalk in the CIP right now? The sidewalk is currently not in the CIP. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. That's why my uh, my thought was not my thought. My earlier response was that now is the time for us to look at CIP. So we'll we'll take another look at it to see how okay. that fits in. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, that's all. Do we have signage in any of these areas? especially up by that Rosner house of um, seniors reduce speed, children reduce speed. Yeah. So around the area, I believe we have some uh, 15 miles per hour zones that, that uh, basically because of the, the presence of children um, in certain locations where and we don't have that in middle, but I've seen it happen before where if it's a con high concentrated senior location, they can lower their speed as well. Yes. Although in this case, most of the area around there are already zoned 15 miles per hour already because even of the up fact by the church, even, but I believe on Arbor, I think, I believe that's the case. I'll double check, but I'm because the church is a pre the church it's actually it's, is has, why it's a because it has a, a, a child care. Yeah. So, and we recently revamped basically citywide. We designated a lot of 15 miles per hour zones around schools, yeah. child cares, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Arbor around this area of middle is definitely one of them. Um, when I was not speeding down Glenwood the other day in my car, I noticed that the speed feedback signs there thanked me for not speeding. What? Yes. yes. So Glenwood, yeah, I noticed that the other day too. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, by, I, by it YouTube said I was, going, I was going 25 or less and it said, thank you. Mm. And I, an I felt good about myself. And yes. I think that if those are speed limit signs, if speed feedback signs are yeah. part of what we're thinking about in these places, yeah. that giving people a little bit of praise for I agree, uh, not you know I, I violating our our proposed speed limit mm -hmm. would be great. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, no, it's Excellent. always yeah, it's always makes you feel good to 
Right. I like the ones that have the flashing red and blue lights if you're speeding, though. Right. Yeah. Those yeah. Ty nice. Typically, we'll have that versus showing the the uh, whatever the actual speed is to try to force, well, not force, but alert them to slow down. And sometimes people will try to drive fast to achieve a number, so we don't show that number. Should we vote on the motion? Is okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think I need a first and a second. I didn't get street cleaning in there. Katie's going to now add to my list of great ideas. For, that we um, figure out how to get that section street cleaned and, and, or, I mean, maybe you just paint the whole thing green and make it just wide enough for the street cleaner, but super obvious that no cars go in there. I don't mm -hmm. know, but yeah, like, we'll, we'll, yeah we'll, we'll look into okay. some, whatever. Um, yeah. What we can do to kind of highlight the area a little better. Yeah. We need a motion to approve whatever, um, what was just said. Sure. Um, I make a motion to approve what Kevin articulated was that uh, we were ap approving the making the bike lane pilot permanent between Olive and University mm -hmm. and between University and El Camino. We were approving the pilot of back in parking at Nilon and we provided a lot of recommendations about signage and parking and other things uh, that uh, pertain to the safety of middle. And, and we side it. with option A. Yes, yeah. option right. A, all yeah. of. Mm -hmm. I'll second it. Okay, great. So we do have a motion by Vice Chair Co, and then a second by Commissioner Baruzzi. Uh, Commissioner that would like to vote. Uh, just maybe any further discussions before I ask for the final vote? Um, no? Okay. Um, I great. just want to say one more thing about Blake, because I know I, I was a little bit touchy about it, and I do... I'm super conflicted, but I did go back to, I was trying to remember what people had emailed me about Blake. And I did hear from a number of residents who said people are totally using this as the allied arts connection to the park, which mm -hmm. was what you were saying as well. So I can sort of see the, I don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I want to just bring that up as well, that, that this is in fact the de facto route for yeah. people. Yeah, so. I mean, I think we're saying we don't take it lightly closing a street and please observe whether it's necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry. So just so that I, I know for sure. So is the commission's feedback to just keep observing or it has it potentially keep it in pilot mode? Okay, keep it in pilot mode. Keep it in pilot mode. Keep it in pilot mode. Got it. Okay. And and look at and and look carefully at the pros, cons, you yeah. know. Yeah. What's it what's it giving us, which is it sounds like safer passage for families accessing the park? What's it costing us? Okay. Okay. And what other sounds solutions good. could be possible instead yeah. of closing the street, like putting a sidewalk on Blake? We yeah, we can we can maybe um we can always look at um like some some conceptual idea about what <laughs> it would take to put a put a sidewalk in. That that's certainly something we can entertain for sure. And again, I think I think a couple of people said it in different ways, but and then you as well. Just um, it's not a it's not a um, an approach we can use often, you know, because we it, we can't, as you said, it would generate multiple requests to close our streets, people's streets. And right. Yeah. It, that's like I say. There's certainly a uniqueness to to what it is, how it's configured, the location, the connectivity, the usage. I, I think it's you know. The perfect storm, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I know it's a poor use of word right there, but it, it's certainly a uniqueness that that makes it um, different than almost any other request that we would have received. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I have one thing I want to say about middle, um, separate and apart from the motion that I've given a lot of thought to? Um, when I was going back to prepare for this meeting, I was going back and looking at like staff reports from the Complete Streets um, two meetings we had in I think May and June of 2022. And one of the things I noticed was in the May meeting in the staff report, there was this table that said um, in October of 2020, uh, city council directed staff to return with options for traffic calming. And then it said in March, 2021, uh, the staff said that city council directed staff again to add middle avenue traffic calming. So as I was thinking this through and the fact that in September of 2022, the city council we really approved the traffic calming very enthusiastically and obviously we went forward with the bike pilot. Um, I think that we, I would just want to argue strongly to rethink this idea that the traffic calming is tied to this resurfacing of the street. 
to me, I thought about this a lot. It almost feels like the tail wagging the dog. Like why is resurfacing the thing that's kind of pulling traffic calming into next year? Oh, yeah. wait, hold on. And I understand that it's more challenging to lay down something like a speed hump and then have to do resurfacing and pull up the speed hump. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me like there's certain elements of the traffic calming that um, would greatly decrease the speed, which people are still talking about and that the speed has not slowed down on the street. We know that's a big safety issue. Um, but there's certain elements that you could put in that would be unaffected by resurfacing later. So for mm -hmm. example, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, at least from the way the flashing beacons are set up in San Mateo Avenue near me on Santa Cruz and then on Blake on middle is that they're, they're embedded in the sidewalk, mm -hmm. right? So you wouldn't, the resurfacing wouldn't affect it. Um, the other thing is the speed limit signs. I know there's some issues with the, I know you said the city attorney or whatever about putting that 25 mile per hour sign between Alvin University, but one of the residents um, who wrote into the CCN um, that I read today was saying that he was part of the Safe Routes to School Committee 30 years ago. And that was the first time that they proposed the 25 mile per hour um, zone between Olive and University. And we still don't have a sign up that says that. So I would just really urge um, the city staff to consider not postponing some things to um, 2025 and moving as quickly as possible is maybe installing the flashing beacons. They don't have to install the race sidewalk, mm -hmm. installing the speed limit signs, maybe even the speed limit signs with the digital flashers. But any of those things would be better than nothing, in my opinion. Um, and I I just, um, it kind of made me... Uh, um, I feel like it's, it's justified to be a little bit impatient when you see, you know, a kind of a historical record of years of people uh, complain, you know, public being very concerned about the speed on middle, which as a, you know, dense suburban environment really shouldn't have that kind of um, speed on it. And then the potentially justified, but sort of a continued push out of that um, timeline. The other thing is, you know, the gentleman tonight talking about Rosner House said, you know, no one's talked about seniors. I'm sure there are pedestrians out there who feel like this conversation didn't really touch on pedestrians, but crosswalks is seniors and pedestrians. You know, I'm living on Santa Cruz. So many of the walkers are seniors um, and they absolutely need to feel safe at crosswalks, whether that's, and we have several, you know, crosswalk enhancements that are just brilliant that you all designed um, for the traffic calming, like, the cotton one and the arbor one that I would be thrilled to see go in before summer 2025. So I just wanted to make mention of that. Um, and I hope you, you know, take my comments in a positive and constructive way. I just, if there's anything the staff can do to expedite elements of it, I think that would be really fantastic. Yeah, no, thank you for that feedback. We'll take that, certainly definitely take that into consideration. All right, um, informational items. Under informational items. Sorry, uh, if I oh, don't. Sorry. Much, Is there anything I, else? I don't. I don't believe I have actually taken the vote yet. So, um, <laughs> so for those commissioners that would like to vote yes to the motion, if you can please raise your hand. I'm seeing unanimous hands. Great. Thank you very much. Now, now are we on informational items? All right. Under informational items, city staff provides an update on matters of importance to the commission. Informational items are not action items. However, a commissioner, city staff member, or member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. The one informational item tonight is update on major project status. Kevin, can you uh, provide us an update? Yes, great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Just one quick update for uh, the commission tonight. So mentioned a few times already about Haven Traffic Calming Plan. Um, many of you know it's a project that's years in the making. We're very close to the finish line. The uh, the Many of the bulb outs within the um, Bell Haven neighborhood have been constructed. Stripings have been implemented, sign signages. There's a few locations where we need to go in and, and make some um, modifications, but but the far few, few, few in between. The one element that I do want to at least draw your attention is the signal at Willow and Newbridge, where we are still continue to work with Caltrans to um, modify that signal. We're getting really close to, to um, 
to being able to actually implement the change. Um, if you're driven by the area, you've probably seen the flashing signs up there already. There's a new controller cabinet there already. So it's very close to, um, to being done. So just wanted to kind of bring that to your attention. Um, as we get closer and closer to the actual implementation day, looking towards uh, the commission here to help um, spread the word as well, because it, it will have a, a phasing change as well. So we want to make sure that we give uh, the, the residents ample time to recognize that it's coming and kind of keep an eye on it. So again, just want to draw your attention to that effort and then uh, continue to update you all as we continue to move forward to completion date. And with that, I will conclude my update. Thank you. Thank you. I would uh, I, I can attest to all those traffic calming measures and the paint that recently went in and the sparkly new yellow crosswalks and the paint, especially the paint that goes across the top of those speed bumps. Mm -hmm. um, super helpful. So anyway, um, thank you. Does anybody have any comments? I Sorry, I wasn't supposed to comment first. My bad. Uh, Matthew, can you please call for public comments on this item? Yes, thank you, Chair. For virtual attendees who wish to provide public comment, you may engage the raised hand feature, or if you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. If you are participating in person, please wait for the chair to call your name. You can then step up to the podium to make your comment. Seeing no virtually raised hands, I return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Okay, um, does anybody have any comments? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Is this my... Um... Oh, good. Nick, no more. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, well, the next item is um, subcommittees for reports and updates. Uh, and Unless, um, yeah, committee, subcommittee reports. Well, I would, I would like nope. to um, throw my hat in the ring for uh, joining a parking subcommittee and working with you, Kevin, on <laughs> maximizing the number of spaces in you. Happy to walk around there with you. And yeah, no, uh, happy to. Um, yeah, we can we can always schedule a quick meeting in the field and then um, walk through walk through the site. Definitely welcome that. Can I just take a really quick minute? Yes, Mostly, of course. I'm just going to say um, thank you to Katie. Baruzzi for um, serving on the Fleet Streets Commission. Like nice. um, I, for one, am super grateful for it. Like when I first started, like Katie is the last of the nine people who were on this commission when I started. And um, the depth of knowledge was really intimidating to me because it was kind of scary what they all knew. And all I had was user data, which as it turns out, for those of you <laughs> listening at home, is actually the stuff that matters from our perspective. Um, and so I just found Katie to be super helpful and encouraging to me. And four years later, I find myself at spring break actually reading the confessions of a recovering engineer. And I have so much background information for it. So it's awesome. Um, but the thing I love also is just to say like engaged citizens tend to stay engaged. And I'm going to look forward to hearing Katie's public comment um, in the future. And for those of you like still watching from home who think that you have to know everything before you sign up for a commission, you don't. Um, you just need to show up and care and be engaged and we welcome all the input. And so we will look forward to seeing you in whatever other thing you do for our city, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Job well done. Eight years, right? Eight years. I just want to um, actually thank uh, our staff. Um, and I really appreciate how like unflappable and unfailingly like generous and um you know, all of the rest. Um, Kevin, it's been really fun to work with you and with Christiane and with Hugh and with Matthew and all the other people we've gotten to um, who've helped us so much. And I love how you always take our calls and you answer our questions, even when they're really dumb questions. Um, and we keep you really late at night. So I'm going to stop now. But I just Thank appreciate you, all of the long days. Yeah, no, I appreciate the kind okay. words. And definitely I, I, on behalf of the you know transportation team, uh, and I'm a little biased. I think we have the best commission. Let's put it out there. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so yeah, I appreciate you, uh, Commissioner Baruzzi. I, I, I think I, 
when I joined the commission as a staff liaison, you were already a bicycle commissioner, if I remember correctly. So you even outdate me in this case. So, but uh, yeah, I, I appreciate all the knowledge that every one of you bring, obviously, but um, definitely um, in this case, Commissioner Bruzi had a lot of history as well that really helped me throughout my first few years. So I definitely appreciate um, the amount of effort and, and knowledge you bring in and also patience sometimes with, uh, with new staff members. So definitely. And sad to see you go, but I'm, I'm sure, like our chair mentioned, um, I'm sure I will hear from you and, and see you elsewhere as well. So uh, this is not a goodbye. It's, uh, we're adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.